even all right looking forward to the day <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm a I grew up on an organic farm um, about 35 minutes north of here a town called Barry um, my parents uh, ran for about 35 years uh, the Northeast Organic Farming Association um, in various aspects my mother was the executive director of the state chapter NOFA, if you've heard of it, is a, um, it's got seven, seven state chapters in the Northeast. Um, my father was the editor of the journal, The Natural Farmer, which is the journal for all seven state chapters for about 30 years, and they ran the annual conference for 25 years. So I'm just saying I come from a, a certain aspect of the culture, um, but I grew up on a homestead. Um, you know, we had a milk cow and pigs and chickens and uh, CSA, mixed vegetables, orchards, um, I, uh, CSA, Farmer's market, that kind of that kind of thing, um, and <clears throat> uh, when I got married and had found no other viable skill set to pay the bills with than farming, I basically had you know worked on the farm in the summer and traveled the world in the winter, and um, you know I grew up on the farm and I thought that was a pretty good lifestyle for for raising kids. Um, so I tried to, I was like, well, okay, I'll I'll do it, um, and I rapidly realized that I couldn't pay the bills farming. Um, I'm not sure if anybody here has heard about this thing about farming being difficult and hard to make a living. Um, uh, what I came to in short order was that the reason I was having a hard time paying the bills was because my plants were sickly, were weak. Um, and I'll just jump right into it. Um, <clears throat> um, this insight came to me most viscerally when I was uh, walking across the driveway with the five gallon bucket after lunch. Um, we're heading out to the potato patch. Um, there's a thing called Colorado potato beetles. I'm not sure if anybody knows what they are, but um, they're little, little guys, they're little larvae, they're fat, red they get, they get little black spots, the, two lines of black dots on the back. And um, you know what we had every year was potato bugs would come in and they would, the adults would lay their eggs, the eggs would hatch, they'd start eating the leaves and pretty soon the leaves would be gone, there'd just be stems and then the plants would be dead. And that would happen before the potatoes had a chance to actually fill out. And so we couldn't get potatoes if we didn't get rid of the bugs. So we'd go out there every two days with a five-gallon bucket and just sort of knock them all into the five-gallon bucket and then dump them in the wood stove or down the toilet or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and it was this day when I was walking out after lunch and <clears throat> uh, I was checking on our, our old farm dog. He had been driven over by a CSA member a few days previously, not his head or chest, just his sort of you know, rear end. Um, they came in the driveway and didn't see him. He was sunning himself. He was old. He didn't get up fast enough. And he got sort of ground into the driveway. And, um, you know, had a big cut, basically no broken bones. He got to hang out inside for a few days. And then he's a dog. He's got a job. It's to chase coyotes and deer and stuff like that. So he was back outside. But I was checking on him. And uh, <clears throat> there were larvae eating his rear end. And we didn't take him to a, you know, vet or anything. He's a dog. He just figure it out, just a cut, you know? Um, but there was sort of some dead flesh in the, in the wound and f flies had laid eggs and the eggs had hatched and the, ha the larvae were, were eating the dead flesh, which is nature's way of cleaning a wound, but I didn't know that at that point in time. I just about lost my lunch. Um, and, uh, and I started thinking about it like, so there's larvae eating my dog alive and I'm like, whoa! And there's larvae eating my potatoes alive. And I'm like, whatever. Being eaten alive by larvae, one could argue, is a sign of poor health. Everybody OK with that? Um, anybody heard of uh, staph, MRSA, versa, flesh-eating fungus? So if you were raising cows and they were being eaten alive by a flesh-eating fungus or chickens, 
or children, you'd probably think something was wrong. Right? You probably would not in good conscience slaughter that cow, slaughter that chicken, feed it to your children, sell it. Right? But every year, we had powdery mildew take out the cucumbers and the summer squash. We've got um, blight hitting the tomatoes. Flesh-eating fungus, I, I would argue a flesh-eating fungus eating you alive is a sign of poor health. Are we all right with that? Right? We're animals, so we understand these things from an animal perspective, but actually it's, do you see flesh-eating funguses taking out the plants in the field or the trees in the forest? Do you see, I mean, sometimes we've got the, the um, what are they called, the uh, gypsy moths. But as a general rule, you don't see larvae eating the plants and nature alive. But as a farmer, you know, in my experience growing up in the organic community, this was just par for the course. If you wanted cucumbers, if you, if you had a CSA and you wanted cucumbers to come in whenever they started coming in, you know, July 1st or whatever it was, and you want them to go through the CSA through till October, you had to plant successions. Every three or four weeks, we'd plant more cucumbers because the powdery mildew would come and their leaves would start green and then they would go to not quite so green and then they'd be definitely white and then they'd be brown and they'd be dead. So if you wanted to keep the, so you got three, four weeks of, of harvesting before this happens. And so what we did is we just planted every three or four weeks, we'd plant another succession of cucumbers. Summer squash, same, same deal. Um, so back to my personal story, I'm trying to make a living raising a family and I'm coming to terms with the fact that the reason I can't make a living is because my plants are sick. All right, right, sickly, um, susceptible to infestation or disease. And I was raised to think that organic was better. Um, at the farmer's market, on the common, every Saturday morning, we had our noses so just a little, you know, extra few degrees elevated over everybody else because we were organic and they weren't, right? I knew, I didn't, we didn't go to church when I was a kid. We went to NOFA meetings. Um, so that was, I guess, the religion that we're organic. It's like, you know, we're, we're Catholics, we're better than the Protestants or, you know, whatever. We're Jews, we're better than the Muslims, whatever. We've all sort of, our circle is better than the others and we have the answers and maybe they will come around to our perspective. That kind of religi religiosity, I would say, not ill-intended per se, but just sort of one of those unconscious human cultural things that is part of the way things seem to be generally. Um, <clears throat> So the first thing I had to do to actually figure out how to make a living was to realize that I was a bad farmer. To come to terms with the fact that I didn't actually know what the hell I was doing. Or I knew how to plant and pick and weed and mulch and bunch and wash. You know, I could do a bunch of things, but I didn't, I wasn't actually creating a reality where my plants were healthy. And so foundationally, um, that started me on a path more than 15 years ago now of, um, just learning, I guess. Um, and so I started reading books and going to conferences and attending seminars. And I would say, you know, studying in the winter and practicing in the summer. And it took maybe two years um, of integrating the things that I was reading, applying them. And I plant my cucumbers in the spring and they got killed by the frost in the fall. And they didn't have those, you know, sort of fat on one end, skinny on the other end cucumbers after three weeks. They were nice, long, well-formed cucumbers to frost, right? They got killed by frost. It wasn't that powdery mildew didn't show up that year. It was that the plants had the functional capacity to be indigestible to it. Um, same with potatoes, right? I'd never seen a potato plant get killed by frost. I just thought they were all dead by August. Like, potatoes are always, always, always dead by August. Well, if the potato bugs don't eat them, they'll keep growing, right? There are some that actually are shorter season than some are longer season, but they should die of their own accord, of their own cycle. They shouldn't be taken out. Um, so it didn't take that long from not being able to make a living to being able to make a living 20 hours a week and having time for quality of life, which was my objective in the first place, was to have a homestead and a family and quality of life. Um, and <clears throat> I realized that if I grew up on an organic farm 
and my parents ran an organic farming organization, and I didn't know these things, then probably other people didn't either. And I was very shy in, you know, when I was younger in school, I, you know, if I say it was in the musical and applied, you know, if I got offered a speaking role, I would say, no, <laughs> I'll be a backup dancer, but I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to repeat lines. I'm not gonna, no, I'm not. So anyway, now I do it. You know, I get up in front of people and I talk to people. So it was, I'm just saying it was not the kind of thing that was natural to me, but I felt like an almost an obligation to say, there's something really important here. Um, to talk about. So that's, I think, what I'm going to be talking about today, but I'm certainly looking forward to engaging conversation and, and, and things like that. I call it principles of biological systems. I've sort of um, developed over the past 10 plus years uh, uh, a shtick. Um, I call it my, my, my 12 hour stand up show. Um, I start with photosynthesis and end with consciousness, and um, we go all over the map. So I don't have 12 hours today to go into things. So um, I'll try to give you a bit of a highlight reel and um, certainly want to engage questions and conversations. Um, <clears throat> if you do want to watch that at the end of it, you know, it's free online. You can find it later. Um, so I'm going to start with a few of these basic principles and, and points and concepts, and then I'm really interested in engaging, engaging conversation. But I think I might as well just cover the bases that I'm going to cover anyways, and then we can, and then we can get into it. Um, So, we know, this is my stick figure plant, if you, does that work for people, Con concept? We know plants are green, most of us, most plants are green, planet wide, pretty much, there's some purple ones but generally they cover themselves in green. Uh, we know the recipe, which is uh, water plus carbon dioxide plus sunlight. Although I hear some people use fake sunlight, which is a really interesting conversation. Um, equals oxygen and sugar. In nature, well, we know, we probably, most of us learned if you went to school um, or even didn't, that uh, plants in this process of photosynthesis take the oxygen that they manufacture and inject it out of their leaves into the atmosphere. Heard about this one? Ever heard about that one? Uh, I didn't learn in school what they did with the sugar part, uh, but I've subsequently learned that in nature, plants take a majority of the sugar they manufacture and functionally inject it into the soil. So I'd like to say we also learned in school, if you went to school, about survival of the fittest and evolution and Darwin and competition. And when I kill you, my children reproduce. You know, when I get all the women, I get to, you know, my, my genetic lineage goes on. This whole fight thing, right? Like domination control. So plants, planet-wide, are green. They cover their bodies in greenness to make two things that they then inject out of their bodies into the environment. Now, I would argue that's not exactly control dominance strategy, right? So I call this conversation principles of biological systems. And one of the foundational points I like to say is, what, did nature, what, what does nature do? You know, some people say, what would Jesus do? I say, what does nature do? If you've ever got a question about what the right thing is to do, do not ask a person. Get the hell off the internet. Don't talk to a salesperson for a product. Start off with, what does nature do? Right? I mean, just because somebody says something doesn't make it true. In most cases, if someone's trying to sell you something, they're trying to sell you something. Am I going too far, too fast? No, we'll start. So far, so good. All right. <clears throat> so what's the deal? Um, why do plants do this? I'm going to focus on the sugar part. Um, because on none of the first six days, it got invent fertilizer. 
right? They say it's been about what, a few hundred million years that plants have been around for, right? Nobody's adding compost or liquid fish or urea or blood or anything like that in the forest, in the field. Indigenous cultures globally were able to manage a landscape in such a degree, in such a fashion as to be able to have fecundity, lots of food producing itself, right? When the white man first came, there was lots of fishes in the streams and you know, game in the, in the forests and the fields. There was nuts and roots and berries and the oceans were jumping with fish, right? Have you ever, anybody read the original historical record about just how profoundly vibrant and vital everything was, right? Managed by humans, right? They understood the role of humans in the ecosystem as caretaker. They were actively, proactively monitoring and managing the ecosystem with no beasts of burden, no plow, no wheel, no fertilizer, no inputs, strategically in symbiosis, serving life, they were able to manage the ecosystem in such a way as to have profound vitality and productivity and not have pest pressure and disease pressure, right? So I hear some people here are afraid of diseases. Anybody? Somebody just told me that this morning, this, uh, Botrytis or Phytophthora or something? I mean, that's for sissies, sorry to say. Um, <laughs> that's rudimentary. Um, anyway, so the deal is plants evolved symbiotic relationships with microbes. Actually, the microbes evolved symbiotic relationships with plants to feed them. If you look into evolutionary biology, the microbes came first and they evolved plants to make sugar to feed them. We think we're growing plants. You know, what I tell people is I don't care what you're growing. It can be cucumbers, it can be apple tree, it can be oats, it can be echinacea, it can be marijuana. It, is, it matters 100% of zero what different crop you're producing, the exact foundational dynamics need to be in place for all of them for them to flourish. And that dynamic is the bottom of the food chain flourishing. Only when the bottom of the food chain is flourishing should the middle of the food chain be expected to flourish. Right, this is rudimentary. And then only should the top of the food chain be expected to flourish. Everybody's heard about the, the Grand Banks off the coast here. The fishermen from, you know, from way up in Canada, down south of here, they all drive their boats to the same spot and park there to go fishing. Anybody heard about the Grand Banks? You know why they all drive their boats from different ports to the same spot to go fishing? That's where the fish are. <laughs> they don't stop in the middle where the fish aren't. They go to where the fish are. You know why the fish are there or not here? That's where their food is. And why is their food there? Only where the foundational environmental conditions are present for the bottom of the food chain to flourish. In this case, it's the phytoplankton. Only where the foundational environmental conditions are, that are necessary are present. Only then does the bottom of the food chain function well, flourish. And only then can the middle of the food chain flourish, and only then can the top of the food chain flourish. So it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, this is the way nature does it, right? And so what, am I, what I say is, I don't care what kind of plant this is. What I care about is, what are the environmental conditions, and how well is the bottom of the food chain flourishing? Only when the bottom of the food chain has what it needs to function should you expect it to flourish. And only then should the middle flourish. So I've said that three, four, five different times now. Maybe that's enough. Um, so the, the, the whole conversation here is what are the conditions that you need to be managing for? What limiting factors? What are the things that are holding life back from flourishing? Identify those things that are keeping life from flourishing, address them, and get out of the way. Right? It's not our job to manage, to get in there with meters and numbers and tools and stuff. Right? That's not our job. Our job is to caretake, is to ensure that nature has what she needs and then take a nap, play with your kids, go swimming. Right? Hopefully you're outside. I'd, hopefully not wearing shoes. Right? We're, the whole point is quality of life. So, all right, that's my opening sort of salvo. Um, 
it's, you know, this area that surrounds the plant roots. It was called the rhizosphere, which is where the vast majority of life in the soil resides. It's not actually just in the soil, it's in the plant, it's in the roots, it's on the leaves. What percent of cells in your body are human? It's something less than 10. What percentage of the DNA in your body is human? Less than one. Right, we've been told that there's this whole kingdom thing. There's the, there's the, there's the animals here, and there's the plants there, and there's the bacteria there, and there's the fungi, and the, the RKE. You heard about this whole thing? Right, you've heard about reductionism? Right, there's, there's chemistry here, and there's biology there, and there's physics here. Like, eh. I know mean, different ways of looking at it, but they sure as hell aren't separate. Right, you can say animals is a way of looking at it, and, bi and bacteria is a way of looking at it, but they're sure as hell not separate. Right? There's actually profound symbiosis, right? How this whole thing works, we don't actually really need to understand it. But just, I'll tell you something to maybe excite you. Um, rhizophagy, anybody heard about this? Rhizophagy, James White from Rutgers, I think it is. Um, we talk about the plants, people who have heard this story about the, the, the sugar being manufactured in the leaf and being injected into the soil and plant root exudates. That's sort of the old story. It's actually not right. What actually happens is as the plant roots are growing, they're actually going out and encapsulating the microbes that are in the soil. They're building their, their roots around the microbes. As they suck them into their body, they literally digest the cell wall. They're like, mmm, food. Like anybody ever eaten an egg or a chicken? Like, ooh, you, know, you harvest the animal, you eat part of it. Maybe it's a chicken, right? You just take the egg and you don't eat the whole chicken. What they do is they take, the, they, they take the cell wall off, they eat that, and then they take some of the protoplasm and they eat that. And then they put some more things back into the protoplasm so that the nucleus is still there. The vacuoles, the whole, all those, pieces of the microbe are still there in the, in the root. And they're like, actually, now we need phosphorus. And so they dial in the microbe, they modulate the DNA, they evolve that, they turn it on to accomplish this function, they, they put protoplasm back in around it, they put a new cell back around it, and they spit it back out into the soil. And they basically inoculate the soil with this new modulation of microbes who have this functional capacity to digest for these things. And then bam, the root comes around again, sucks them in. It's not like they're injecting soluble nutrients into, into the soil, right? It's, it's not like the microbes are saying, okay, they're pissing out some, some copper. Like the plant is profoundly symbiotically working with the microbe evolving it in profound symbiosis and subtlety and sensing and communication and coordination, right? This is how nature does it. The, the microbes are in the roots. Sometimes they're going up, they're in the stem, they're on the leaf. They're, the, the top two layers of the leaf are microbes. They're there to defend, protect the plant from pathogens. How many species should you have on your hand? Dozens at least, right? How many species should you have in your armpit? Again, dozens at least, different ones. And on your arm right here, it's gonna be different, right? We're coded with, within and without, not just our gut, everywhere, microbes. It's how we've evolved. So what are the environmental conditions that microbes need to function in the soil. Because once you've got that dialed in, that's when you don't work. It's really simple. Microbes need um, air to breathe, aerobic. There's a lot of them that breathe air. So uh, well, oxygen, <laughs> oxygen, sorry, not carbon dioxide or nitrogen. They, they need air to breathe. So um, what I like to say is, and I have heard that some people grow pot not in soil or dirt 
or in the ground at least. They grow it in other things. So, I mean, that's stupid, but um, <laughs> we'll talk about it. If you're going to do that, there's ways you can do it better or worse. But understand that one of the things that microbes, so, and sometimes people actually try to grow plants without microbes. You heard about this one? <laughs> right? You heard about this one? They, called it, they call it controlled environment agriculture now because hydroponics is getting a bad name because it's a bad thing to do. <laughs> They've got a fancy new names for it. There's billionaires putting hundreds of millions of dollars into these big greenhouses to grow you know, tomatoes and, and salad greens and I guess, I guess pot too, right? Because they're, they're money people and they think about in industry and factory style paradigm control product mentality, right? So they try to grow <laughs> plants without microbes. Um, but we're going to presume that's not how nature did it, and so we're not going to talk about that. We're going to say there's some certain things you need. So I'm going to talk about soil because that's what I know. And I'll try not to be too disrespectful to people who don't grow in soil. Um, but if you're talking about coco coir and stuff like that, or, or you know, foam, little chunks of foam, like I can't speak really to that. Um, and I, I, I can sort of, I can intuit perhaps what the concerns may be, but I'm going to talk about soil. So my experience as a farmer, when you go out to the field, um, is sometimes if you try to put your hand into it, it gets underneath your fingernails real tight. Like it's, it's hard to get your hands into the soil. I would say that's more dirt than soil, so we can define terms. It's like junk and food. It's either food, like here's food, there's junk, it's a continuum. Here's soil, there's dirt, there's a continuum. Right? They're actually different things. Um, so if, you're, if, you can't get oxid, if you can't get your fingers in, there's probably not enough air for the microbes to breathe. So people can talk about minerals, they can talk about inoculants, they can talk about all kinds of fancy things. But if you don't have air for them to breathe, they're going to be dead. So take a chicken, take a human, take a, a cat, don't let it breathe for just even you know, a couple hours. <laughs> Maybe, you know, I don't know, sea turtles and, I mean, there's certain things that can do without, but, um, so aeration, I, I'm, I'm going to go through the, con the basic points, like what are the basic things you need, and then I'm going to talk about ways to manage for them. Like, so how do you identify the deficiency, and then how do you, as low tech, as little effort, as little expense as possible, manage the environment for these things. And then, and then, you know, we'll probably have time for a break at some point and other topics. So air is the first one. <clears throat> uh, here comes another big one. <laughs> water, right? Microbes need water to drink. Um, again, maybe not an issue in a hydroponic system because um, you're busy managing it and water is the... Wait, heard about IV drips? Anybody heard about an IV drip? Like were you to be in a car accident or whatever and get taken life flight to the hospital and um, be in a coma, whatever, you can be kept alive with soluble nutrients being injected into your bloodstream, right? It's possible. They do it. You know, I'd rather be alive than dead, so I'm not going to complain if this is happening to me, but just because soluble nutrients are being injected into my bloodstream does not mean that my microbiome is supported in this process. And we know about the microbiome and immune system function and hormone and glandular system. And there's all kinds of important things here. So, so nutrients, soluble nutrients injected into the bloodstream can keep you alive. But after 12, 24, 36, 48 hours of that, how is everybody in your gut doing? They're not doing so well. So, I mean, we can talk about fertilizer, technically fertilizer, by definitions, you know, government owns the word, means soluble nutrient. A nutrient that can be solubilized in solution. So, um, I would call that an IV drip as opposed to food, right? So you can be kept alive through soluble nutrients, but you're supposed to eat food and they're supposed to be going through the microbes and that's how you are able to flourish. So, um, hydration is massive. Um, again, pick up some soil, like I want, it, I want to be able to sense some moisture in there. And so maybe again, not an issue for people who are growing indoors, 
but um, you know, maintaining hydration throughout the whole life cycle is massive. Um, um, so air, water, food, food is the next one. <clears throat> um, in nature, I said something about the uh, plants being green and that makes sugar and that functionally feeds the soil life. I talked about how complex it is, but um, uh, one thing I like to talk about for people who are growing outdoors, um, or actually probably even in Coco Coir, uh, is that microbes need to be kept alive like continuously. So um, I say most microbes don't hop on a plane in November and fly down to Florida for the summer, for the winter. Like most, most microbes stay in the soil um, all, all, all winter long. And so, uh, you know, what we did when I was a kid on the farm was we would can and we would freeze and we would root cellar and we would dehydrate, right? We didn't buy meat, we didn't buy dairy, we didn't buy vegetables, we didn't buy fruit, we didn't buy, you know, a lot of things. I think the only thing we really bought was grain. Um, anything we ate, even in the middle of the winter, was stuff that we had grown in the summer and put by. So when the green leaves are not making sugar in February, what are the microbes eating? Uh, they got, there's got to be food there for them, otherwise they're going to be dead by springtime. And so um, you know, that would be organic matter. That would be, you know, I use mulch. Um, people talk about cover crops. There's all kinds of ways to keep the microbes fed through the entirety of the season. But you don't, if you're taking your seeds and you're putting them into soil in the spring or dirt because it's tight and you got to loosen it up to put things in there, um, there's no microbes there. That means there's no gut flora there. That means you put these plants into this ecosystem where they're not being fed and you shouldn't be surprised when they struggle later. Um, so, so air, water, food, um, and where's the food for the microbes in the soluble nutrient solution? Soluble nutrient solution, food for microbes where, that's the IV drip. The IV drip is a soluble nutrient solution. How are the microbes being fed? Um, anyway, uh, minerals, There's a whole bunch uh, of different minerals that are necessary for life to function. There's these things called enzymes, um, um, which we, I use the metaphor of talking about them like they're um, sockets and wrenches. Um, we can maybe go into biochemistry a little bit. I think this is probably pretty important for people that are caring about terpenoids and things like that. I mean, do you know how these things are made in life? Do you know what it is that, you know, provides the capacity for the plant to build high levels of these complex compounds in itself. Um, biochemistry, um, if you don't have these various different elements, the copper and the zinc and the molybdenum and the cobalt and the vanadium and the yttrium, and um, the, the broader the spectrum of elements in the ecosystem you have, pe maybe people have heard about sea salt, sea minerals. Uh, there's somebody here with rock dust. Uh, I'm basically in the opinion between seawater and rock dust, we have access to all the minerals we need if you have an environment that is deficient in some, some element. So it's not like we have to be using fertilizer. You know, the oceans are made of seawater and the continents are made of rock. So nature gives us plenty of these basic raw ingredients which have the full spectrum of elements in them. Um, but if you don't have an element, let's just give, um, uh, I'll, use, I'll use cobalt as an example. Um, if you don't have cobalt, there's this thing called uh, B12. People may have heard about B12. Uh, um, if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, sometimes you're told that you don't have enough B12 in your plant-based diet. Anybody heard this one? Some people have heard this story, right? And the doctor, if you go to one, um, which I'm not sure that's a good idea, but a lot of people do these days. I certainly don't. Um, will tell you that you need to take a pill or a shot of a B12 supplement because it's actually true that if you don't have enough B12 in your body, you know, things stop working. So if uh, just not quite enough means you become anemic, you become lethargic. Um, really not enough means you become dead, right? We need a certain amount of B12 in our bodies to become, to be alive. And if we don't have it, we become dead. So we are B12 dependent organisms. Um, <clears throat> B12 is a compound that has at the, at the center of it, this thing called cobalt. It's an element like copper or zinc. Um, the amount of cobalt we need is really very, 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 very small. 
But if we don't have that in our bodies, we're dead. We're, we are cobalt dependent organisms. Um, of, all the, of all the families and species of, of microbes that are there have been studied, about 80% of them are B12 dependent. They also must have, they have the same enzyme pathways. Actually, life is remarkably similar across the kingdoms, right? The biochemistry, which is a complex, scary kind of concept, but basically it's not that hard to understand, is so similar across the kingdoms. The bacteria, the fungi, the plants, the, the animals, are the way our cells work, the way protein gets built, the way carbohydrates are complexed, it's exactly the same across all these living systems, and you need these sockets and wrenches, these enzymes, which have at their core elements for these basic biological processes to occur. So um, people talk about inoculation. There's been talking about KNF. I guess people are talking about KNF in the circle. Uh, there's IMO. There's, you know, there's, I mean, there's any number of ways of ensuring a broad spectrum of microbes are present in the environment, but if you don't have the cobalt present in the environment, you can put all the microbes in you want, they're gonna die, right? The compost tea, this whole thing about compost tea, people talk about it. If the environmental conditions are sufficient for the microbes to do well, you should need to add them once if they're not there. And then they would establish and reproduce and that's it. You don't, you don't need, you should not need to keep adding, right? However, if you don't have something like B12 present in the environment or cobalt present in the environment, it's like dropping a bunch of, you know, take a, I mean, I think actually they did this not too far east of here in the early 1600s. They took these ships full of people and they dropped them off into an environment that they were not able to survive in and they mostly died. And they took another ship and they brought over, they dropped a bunch of them off and a bunch of them died. Right? You can take your compost tea and you can apply the microbes to the environment, but if the environment is not sufficient for those microbes to do well, they're going to die. Uh, minerals is a key piece of this puzzle. Um, you know, boron, sulfur, molybdenum. Um, another minor point, because I've, I've been known for talking about minerals in the past, um, is this element molybdenum. Molybdenum um, is the center of the nitrogenase enzyme. It's fancy words, you don't need to remember them. But the basic concept is, um, that about 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. People maybe have learned this one in school too. Right? That's more than three quarters of every breath of air you breathe is nitrogen. Um, again, on none of the first six days did God invent fertilizer. So for the first few hundred million years that plants were around, nobody was adding blood, fish, compost, urea, most plants aren't legumes. And for hundreds of millions of years, they've been able to get their nitrogen needs met without people adding nitrogen because they evolved a symbiotic relationship with microbes to access the profound amount of nitrogen in the environment, right? Nature would do that. Nature, nature would do that. But to do that, for the microbe to access the nitrogen, they need this socket or wrench, this enzyme, specifically the nitrogenase enzyme, which has at its core this one atom of molybdenum. If you don't have the molybdenum, it's really hard to get the nitrogenase enzyme, then you can't grab the nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Um, about one pound per acre is what you need on land, if you're growing on land, to have all the nitrogenase enzymes you need for every family of plants. It doesn't matter what kind of plant it is. Again, it does not matter what kind of plant it is to access all the nitrogen it needs from the environment. Molybdenum is an anion, which means it leaches, it washes out in, when it rains. And so, you know, even though you only need one pound, if you don't have it, the nitrogen fixation process doesn't occur. And then your plants need nitrogen. And then you're starting to add stuff. And then you're getting things imbalanced. And then you're getting insect pressure and disease pressure and all these other dysfunctions uh, because you're not working with nature, because the plants aren't getting what they need when they need it through a symbiotic relationship with the microbes. Um, the final thing I like to talk about here is the microbes life itself. Certainly, if you are dealing in an environment where a full spectrum of life is not present, I say the simplest, least expensive, quickest, 
biggest bang for your buck thing you can do is inoculate. Again, I don't have a, a dog in the fight about KNF versus powder inoculants versus IMO versus compost tea. I mean, what matters is the job is done. And sometimes people are selling products or selling concepts if it's true, if it works, that's great. If it doesn't, you should stop doing it and stop talking about it. The point is a full spectrum of microbes present in the environment is absolutely foundational. And so um, I say, again, if you're going to take one thing away from my presentation, you know, this is going to cost you five bucks and take five minutes um, for the entire year, it would be to inoculate. Um, and so I like to think about inoculation happening at um, birth. People may have heard about this concept that when you're born, there's nobody between your mouth and your rear end, the alimentary canal, you heard about it? It's big, long, whatever it is, 25 foot long tube, right? right. There's nobody on your, well, the passage through the birth canal coats your, your leaf surface, whatever you want to call it, with microbes, establishes your surface gut flora. And then there's this thing called colostrum, which is the first thing that comes out of the mother's breast, which is a probiotic, a prebiotic. Before you get milk, you get colostrum, right? Anybody know about this one? Hey, because you can't digest milk. We actually can't digest much. We're animals, we can't digest our food. Just like plants can't digest the environment, they can only do it in symbiosis with microbes. We can't digest our environment, we can't digest what goes into our bodies. It's the people inside of us that do it. And so the first thing you gotta do after you're born is get your gut flora established so you can digest food. So it's the, I mean, I mean K and F, whatever your, whatever your angle is to this, 100%, massively important. Um, I don't necessarily think you need to be doing much more once you've done it once, if the other factors are in place. If the other factors are in place, you should not need to keep doing it. Um, so uh, I like to talk about um, a colicky baby. I'm not sure if anybody's heard about, you know, when babies are born, sometimes they cry. Uh, sometimes people say that, you know, we've got a, new, a newborn um, and I haven't slept for a year, right? Or gotten a good night's sleep for a year because they say babies cry. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. You know, they say plants are susceptible to fungal pathogens. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Ma, <coughs> ma. Right, that's an alarm system. That is nature's alarm system telling you something is really, really wrong, right? It's the same pitch and tone as a fire alarm. It gets all of your attention. The frequency is such that you are evolved to pay total attention to this and deal with it right now. A colicky baby, a baby that cries a lot, colic, they haven't got a well-established gut flora. Right? Whether they didn't get colostrum, whether they've been on, on um, formula, maybe they've gotten uh, antibiotics. If you don't have that well-established gut flora, <laughs> nature's like, this is a critical issue. It must get addressed. Otherwise, this thing will be dead. Right? Anybody who's been around cows in a barn, have you ever heard you know, baby calves bawling? Right, same kind of experience. Generally, when a calf does not get colostrum, it is just, it is just known that they will be dead in a week. Right? Farmers know. Even though you're going to be putting the calf on milk replacer because you want to keep the milk to sell, so you take powdered milk to feed the baby calf, which is... Anyway, if you don't give them colostrum, they're going to be dead. So I think about inoculation. I think about germination and birth, establishing gut flora at birth for an animal we understand is critically important, establishing gut flora at birth for a plant understand is critically important. So, um, I mean, I know, I guess sometimes people don't actually start with seeds. They do cuttings and things like that. So, I mean, um, you know, there are things you can do, right? Hopefully the mother plant had a good, well-functioning microbiome. I'm, I'm guessing there's ways that it can be established, but the general point here is um, this is a very, very important piece of the puzzle. So um, 
I will, I will just give you uh, one example quickly here of inoculation that is not KNF. Um, I'm not saying it's not a good thing. I think it's, a, it's actually a very good thing. Um, but just to conceptually say how easy it can be. Because um, I generally like to suggest processes and practices that are um, free if possible, as inexpensive as possible, and not needing to have money transact if possible. Um, so uh, anybody ever seen a zucchini plant? Maybe in like, I don't know, um, middle of June, it's like growing rapidly. It's like brah, just feisty and nice, dark, shiny green leaves and just, just really kicking. You know that look? That look on a zucchini leaf, that sheen on the leaf. You're like, I don't know why I know, but I know you're happy. You know what that sheen on a leaf is? Wax. Wax. Fat. Plants do this interesting thing. They, when they have more food to eat than they need, they stockpile that extra food in the form of fat. Anybody ever heard about this concept? Right? The waxy cuticle, the, 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 the sheen on the leaf, how shiny it is, is effectively telling you how fat and happy it is. Right? In the olden days, we'd say that, calf, that cow is fat and happy. Right? It wasn't a bad thing to have a little bit of extra cushion on you. That was, that's not a bad thing. So when a, when a plant has a sheen on its leaf, that means it's fat and happy. That means it's getting more food to eat than it needs. Um, when a cow has a sheen on its coat, you know it's doing well. When it has a, a dull coat, when you look at the cow and you can see there's, not, there's no sheen anymore, the brown or whatever the color of the cow is, is dull, that means something's wrong. It works with kids too, right? Kids have a glisten in their eye, they got a sheen on their coat, they're, they're, they've got shine in their hair, they're healthy. They got dull eyes, they got, you know, there's no shine in their hair, they're not, something's wrong. Like, we're actually animals, you know, they say we've lost instinct. Like, we haven't lost instinct, we've just been, you know, not tuned into it. We, it it's still there, we actually know a lot of these things basically intuitively, but the point is about sheen on plant leaves and not zucchini plants. The point is about plants in nature. Um, so I propose uh, to, when you're interested in inoculating um, or reestablishing a broad spectrum of microbes, uh, indigenous, because I'm dealing personally with soil and my soil is you know, from here, it's not from somewhere else. I didn't bring it in a bag, I didn't bring it in the back of a truck. It's not the soil from Montana or Mozambique, it's the soil from Massachusetts. So there are indigenous microorganisms that are from here um, and so what I like to do is say, take a bucket or a bag, bike gallon bucket, plastic bag, whatever it is, and you gotta go for a walk. Um, you probably wanna hit as many microclimates as possible. So field, forest, meadow, edges, riparian zones, you know, swamp, stream, high, rocky, low, wet, whatever it is, you wanna hit as many microclimates as possible with your bucket or your bag and you're looking for plants that have a sheen on their leaf. Anybody that's got a sheen on its leaf is fat and happy. They have a well-established mic mycorrhizal, bacterial, broad ecosystem function microbiology. Nobody's adding fertilizer in the forest. Nobody's putting nitrogen down. No one's putting phosphorus down. Those plants somehow are feeding themselves and doing so well so we can, we, can, we can logically deduce that a plant that's got a sheen on its leaf in nature has a well-established gut flora. Does that sort of make sense? So what do you do? You take your hand, again, high tech here. If you want to, you know, have a little quiet thank you or, or please conversation with the plant um, and reach down and take a handful of the soil underneath it and put it in your bag and keep moving. Uh, you hit, want to hit as many different microclimates as possible. You want to hit as many different families of plants as possible, right? We're talking, you know, sumac and, um, you know, goldenrod and oak and, you know, pigweed, um, you know, skunk cabbage. We've heard about this thing where, like, um, different animals have different gut flora. Like, 
like the gut flora of a cow is different than the gut flora of a chicken, right? The colostrum from a cow should be fed to a calf, not to a, a chick or a, a baby rabbit, right? The, the cows have four stomachs. They've got a different, a different microbiology, a different gut system function. So, so they've got different microbi different, different, different microbiome. Um, you know, a, 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 a um, dandelion has a different gut flora from pigweed, from oak. They're different organisms. They've got different gut floras. So they've got a different sweet spectrum of microbes that they work symbiotically with. There's uncounted how many millions and you know, numbers of species of microbes. Not all of them are symbiotic with every family of plants. But if you're hitting multiple micro microclimates and you're hitting multiple families of plants and you're getting a broad spectrum, presumably, from each of those families of plants because they've got shiny leaves and you got that all in your bucket or your five gallon or your, or your bag when you get home, just a couple pounds of dirt, right? You've got a profound spectrum of microbes that you've just harvested from your immediate ecosystem. And so what I say is take your couple pounds of soil, duff, whatever you want to call it, stick it in a five gallon bucket, you know, put some water in that bucket, stir it up, let the soil fall to the bottom, and you know, before they use up all the air in the water, which takes only a couple hours, you've got a massive spectrum of microbes from your environment in that water, which you can put into a watering can or a backpack sprayer or an irrigation line. Um, you know, when you're planting your seed or when you're transplanting or, or whatever you want to do, you can functionally you know, re-indigenize your soil that may have been abused over time by tillage or chemicals or or whatever environmental conditions. Um, you know, certainly there are some species which are no longer present um, or are in rough shape. So I'm not opposed to bringing in also inoculants from out offsite, um, whether they're in the form of, of dried powders or whatever it is. You know, as I understand it, the communities that a plant is supposed to establish symbiotic relationships with, it will. And the communities it's not supposed to establish symbiotic relationships with, it won't. So you can put a whole bunch of different species into the environment of the root of the plant you're growing. And the ones that aren't supposed to work, that don't work with it, won't. So they won't get fed, they won't reproduce. So um, in general, I say the broader the spectrum, the better. And you know, getting down to the details and the science of getting this family and that family and this sub, sub line, like get out of there. You know, like what do we know? We don't know much. Like, don't get all sciencey about it. Get just just get as broad a spectrum as possible. Um, so, that's life um, foundational here in this process. And um, you know, whatever your way is of getting it, I would say get it. Um, we understand that it is the life that does the job of digesting the environment and feeding it to the plant. Um, and I'm going to go back to the minerals here. Uh, topic and talk about enzymes. Again, I don't usually do this in this order, but I think for this community, if your crop is valuable based on the secondary metabolites in it, right, those aromatic flavor compounds, which we're wired for actually, you know, to tell us something is good or not, um, and is how your crop value is determined, which is great because where I come from in farming, we don't determine carrot value based on flavor. We determine carrot value based on pounds. So in this community, as I understand it, you know, quality is determined by flavor, which is wonderful. I think people do this with wine. They do it with coffee, right? For some reason, the things that you use to shift your consciousness, we really focus on the quality about and the things that we should be using to base our consciousness, food, we don't focus on quality, but that's another longer conversation. Um, so I talked about the enzymes. I talked about that uh, to some degree. I want to really get this thing, you know, clearly conveyed here because I think it's a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, people have heard about a hoop house. You heard about hoop houses. Anybody ever built one? Put one up, take one down, right? So you start with when you're building a hoop house, a pile of pipes that's whatever it is, 10, 12 feet long. Say we're talking about a like 100 foot hoop house, 30 foot wide. That's what it's going to be at the end. Right. It's a pile of pipes. It's 10, 12 feet long. It's a couple feet wide. It's a couple feet tall. It's a pile of pipes. 
And you get some nuts and some bolts and some little attachment things, right? Another pile of little stuff here. You start with all those ingredients and you end up with this massive structure. 100 feet long, 30 feet wide. Ooh, ah, it's like a, you know, church. <laughs> sacred, sacred space, for me at least, when you're in a hoop house. Um, the tools you needed to take that little pile of pipes and build this big structure, the grand total of the tools you needed was a 9 16 and a half inch socket and a wrench for each of them. Right? You got your, you your socket, you get your wrench for 9 16 you got your socket and your wrench for a half inch. You're just over and over and over again putting the pieces together, putting the your bolts in, putting the nuts on, tightening them down, over and over and over again, use the same thing, right? This little, little thing that has a very specific size and shape, right? You get a metric socket, it's not gonna work. Like, you get a, you know, a 7 16 you get a, a 3 quarters, not gonna work. You get a, a Phillips head, not gonna work. You get a star bit, not gonna work. You need these very specific, unique sizes and shapes used over and over again to put something together. You take this little pile of stuff and you make this big, big thing. So people have heard about um, maybe protein, heard about protein, it's a thing. Um, they say it's made out of amino acids. You heard about that part, right? So they say you take all the amino acids and you screw them all together. And when, they're all, when you screw them all together, you got this thing that's called a protein. And um, <clears throat> you may have heard about uh, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, they say, are made out of sugar. So you take all the sugars, which are things, and you screw them together. Not really things, they're vibrations, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, the things you use to screw the sugars together to make the carbohydrates are called enzymes. The things you use to screw the amino acids together to build the protein are called enzymes. It's a, it's a compound, a biochemical compound. It's got a unique size and shape. Unique size and shape, just like that 9 16 It's used over and over and over again to screw the amino acids together to build the protein. When you eat that protein, the same exact enzyme is used in your gut to unscrew those nuts off the bolts to break it down into amino acids, which is what your body can digest. So you use that 9 16 to tighten or to loosen. Use the enzyme to put together or take apart. What gives the enzyme its unique functional capacity is the element at its core. There's copper-based enzymes and zinc-based enzymes and chromium-based enzymes and molybdenum-based enzymes and sulfur-based enzymes. You do, how many elements can you name? And there's this thing called DNA, um, which they say is at the center of all of our cells. Um, I'm going to go back one step. If you ha were a car and your brake pads wore out, you're designed to have your brake pads taken out and new brake pads put in, right? If you're a car and your muffler wears out, you're designed to have your muffler taken out and new muffler put in, right? If you're a human, you're not designed to have your knee taken out and replaced. We're, a mechanical system is a series of parts that are designed to be replaced when they break. We are not mechanical systems, we are biological systems. Whether you know it or not, on a daily basis, billions of cells in your body are replaced. Your, your eyeballs, you got your liver, you got your blood, you got your bones, you got your flesh, you got your, I mean, you got all kinds of different things. Every single day, your body takes the cells in those parts of your body that are in worst shape, takes them apart, replaces them, takes the junky parts out the rear end they go, puts new ones in their place. So we're a biological system. We're not designed to have our knees taken out and replaced, our liver. We're designed to have our bodies keep being rebuilt. And whether you know it or not, average it out. Your blood takes two weeks, your bones take seven years. You get a new body every six months. Everybody gets a new body every six months. And that's built out of what you put into your body. Um, at the center of every cell 
is this thing called the nucleus. Inside the nucleus is this thing called DNA. People have heard about this. So four billion times a day, your DNA is being replaced. DNA is a big, long compound. It takes a bunch of different enzymes to screw the thing together. At the center of every enzyme is an element. It takes dozens of different elements, literally dozens of different elements, copper, zinc, calcium, potassium, sulfur, phosphorus, how many can you name, to replicate every strand of human DNA. Every single strand of human DNA needs a bunch of different elements at the core of the enzymes to replace it just for basic bodily maintenance. This is not your hormonal system, not your glandular system, not your all kinds of other systems. This is just basic bodily maintenance. So enzymes, you know, are critical in biochemistry. At the core of them is elements. A terpenoid is a big, long biochemical compound. It's a big compound. You don't get terpenoids and alkaloids and phenolics, plant secondary metabolites, until you've got lipids. You don't get lipids until you got protein. You don't get protein until you get carbohydrates. You don't get carbo. You start with simple sugars. You start with simple things, and you build them, build them, build them, build them, build them. That's a process. You start with you know C6H12O6. Do your math. How many elements is that? 24. How many elements? Sorry, atoms. How many atoms is that? That's that's 24 atoms, not elements. It's three atoms, three elements. 24 atoms. A terpenoid may have 24,000 atoms in it. It's a big compound. There's a bunch of screwing together stuff that has to happen. A bunch of different ingredients. It takes a lot of work to take simple compounds and put them together, put them together, put them together. That work in nature is done by the microbes, right? Plants don't take into their bodies simple ions of calcium, simple ions of potassium. They take into their bottoms, into their bodies, these already biological compounds. They're, they're screwing together, you know, 500 element compounds to make that terpenoid in nature. If you start with, sim with simple ions, if you start with one atom here, two atoms there, two atoms here, two atoms here, and you got to screw them all together to get a 24,000 element compound or atom compound, that's a lot of work. Without life actually feeding the basic ingredients to the plant, the plant doesn't have the energy to build the high levels of those compounds. Everybody get that? If your focus is quality, if your focus is these aromatic flavor, nutritional, medicinal compounds, if that's what you're actually trying to do, not, you know, I mean, there's quality of life, there's paying the bills, there's all kinds of other stuff too. But if, if really what it's about is, is that, um, it's, you know, it's foundational that you do it in symbiosis with life. Um, one of the pieces of the puzzle here is elements. Um, you know, I talked about sea salt. We can talk about it in greater detail. I talked about rock dust. We can talk about it in greater detail. There's other things you can use. Um, <clears throat> people may have heard about azomite or, you know, maybe they've heard about uh, Redmond salt. I mean, azomite is rock dust. Redmond salt is sea salt. You can pay 50 bucks a bag for Redmond salt or you can pay 250 a bag for Kansas salt. It's still salt. You can go to the ocean and, you know, get some seawater and you don't need to pay anybody. Oh, I have to go to the ocean. Oh shit, that's farm, that's farm work. That's, that's, on the, that's on the clock, right? We're gonna go harvest some nutrients. Um, same as going for a walk to get the microbes. This is, this is farm time, right? This is, I'm working. You know, establishing microbiome, I have to go for a walk. If you wanna think about it right, you can figure out that actually quality of life, you know, can be easily integrated into this process. But so broadly, life and minerals I've talked about. Um, just a quick time check, may I, about where we are? What's that? 10.22, we started theoretically at nine, so we're supposed to have a break at 11. So, okay, do it fine. Um, food, um, anybody ever planted garlic? A couple people planted garlic. We do it around here in the fall. Most people do, actually. Um, Actually, in nature, <laughs> nobody pulls the garlic out of the ground in August and then puts it back in in October. We think about that one, but anyway, um, 
what we've done in the farm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's garden area, you know, maybe we've got carrots growing in the fall, you pull all the carrots. Um, it's middle of October, end of October, you put your garlic in. Um, what we usually do is mulch it. Nice, nice thick layer of mulch. We use, we use hay, people can use leaves or I don't care what you use. Um, but say the carrot patch was, was a quarter acre and the garlic patch is an eighth of an acre. Half of that space is not planted with, with garlic, not mulched, usually left to be bare. Um, um, my experience when the snow melts and the ground thaws out, which used to be end of March, beginning of April, but isn't that often these days then, um, is when the garlic starts to grow, if you were to, you know, reach your hands down through the mulch, you know, and look for a second, you would probably see piles of worm castings. But then if you reached your hand down into the soil, you would be able to pick it up and you would be able to smell it. And um, that's soil, right? You can reach into it and you can smell it. These are two really simple ways of knowing. Um, but right directly adjacent to that area where the, where the garlic wasn't planted, where it wasn't mulched, my experience beginning of April, it's, you know, oftentimes it doesn't rain. It's a fire sign, right, Aries. Um, it's windy sometimes. Um, it's tight. It's cracked. Like it'll literally, literally be cracked, like dry and then cracked. And so you can't reach your hand into it. That's dirt. Um, what was it that caused this soil here to stay soil and this soil here to turn into dirt was not the planting of the garlic. The, the, the little pieces of garlic that I put in the ground is not what caused one to have worm castings and aroma and air and the other one to be tight. It was the fact that the microbes here had, you know, the root cellar full and the freezer full and lots of dehydrated and everything else, food put by for the winter, they had mulch. And these guys over here didn't. They starved to death. I think I said this earlier. Keeping the microbes fed through the entire cycle is foundationally important. Um, uh, people think about the fact that they're growing plants. They think they're growing plants, right? It's arrogant. Uh, it's life <laughs> is growing plants. You're just hopefully supporting the process. Um, they don't think about the fact that it's the microbes that are doing the job, and they don't think about the fact that they need to be supported through the entire 12 months of the year. You can't just feed your kids when they go to school and not feed them in summer vacation if you consider school to be work, which is a whole perverse perspective, but get the concept, right? Like the microbes need to be fed continuously. Um, so I like to say, what would nature do? Uh, where in nature do you see bare soil? Or oftentimes when it's bare, it's not soil, it's dirt. You know, we can say the desert or we can say, you know, things like that. And I would say then in response to you, how well is nature doing in that ecosystem? Where you find nature flourishing, where you have profound vitality and fecundity and, and you know, broad spectrums of different species of various kingdoms all working in symbiosis, you don't ever see bare soil or very, very rarely, maybe a tree falls over for a little bit and then it gets covered. Nature keeps herself covered. Um, we can talk about whether we want to anthropomorphize and how much we want to anthropomorphize, but it does seem that, you know, the way it works is the soil is covered. Um, people sometimes will, <laughs> I mean, they'll do this thing in the fall where they're, you know, the trees will be putting down a layer of mulch for you and they'll, <laughs> they'll come and take it off. <laughs> and then they wonder why things don't grow well in the spring there. You ever seen that with people in the fall? With the blowers and the, and, the, and, the, and the things, yeah, right? And then they got to bring somebody in in the spring because the, you know, the plants don't grow, the grass doesn't grow because it's not soil, it's dirt. They got to aerate it and they got to fertilize it and spray it and then it's... Just let nature be. Let the, let the mulch, nature's mulching herself, let that fall down and be there to feed the microbes and in the spring <laughs> it'll take care of itself. So um, keeping plants, you know, in an ecosystem where the microbes have never been allowed to starve to death and are continuously evolving and, and, and present is, is foundational. Um, you know, 
we think of the end of the growing season, if we're growing in soil outside, as the fall. And then we think of the beginning of the growing season, if we're growing in soil outside, is the spring. And I would say nature is not so linear. Nature is a more of like a cyclical thing. Um, we can think of the end of one growing season as the beginning of the next growing season, right? It's, it's, but you have to understand that it's really about maintaining life and, and foundational to maintaining life is food. Um, there are some times of the year when you've got green leaves and a good canopy that's really kicking sugar down, but, you know, and the soil is covered to some degree from sun and things like that by the, by the canopy. But in some periods of the year, you have, um, you know, maybe green plants, but a lot of space in between that's not green plants. And so, you know, people talk about watering their plants. <laughs> um, if you go to a farm, like sometimes you'll see like the black plastic, right? Everybody been to a farm, like you get the row of tomatoes and the black plastic, and there's a drip tape sometimes that goes down the middle underneath the black plastic, and then you got your tractor path because you gotta have tractors in there. And then that's six or eight feet wide, but you don't wanna have weeds growing because you don't like weeds, so you keep it tilled up. Anybody ever been to one of these farms? Seen this kind of model? And it doesn't, it's not just the big ones, right? Because there's people that do it, that have gardens that do the same thing. And so you think about it, your tomato plant, we'll talk about tomato plants, you can talk about pot plants, whatever kind of plants you want to talk about. Um, say it's six feet tall, eight feet tall, 10 feet tall, whatever it should be. Um, as above, so below. You'd like to have as much area underground in roots or more being fed as you have area above ground of plant, right? There's actually these things called hormones. Plants have them too. Uh, cytokinins and auxins, they're, they're plant growth hormones. They actually balance each other, the growing root tip and the growing leaf tip. They keep the plant in this bushy structure, which some people have to prune for, but you shouldn't have to prune. I mean, who in nature is pruning things, right? I mean, tomato plants, like really? There's the whole thing about spacing too. Like how big does a tomato plant want to be? So give it that much space but I'm not sure if I have time for that conversation. Um, the point is about water now. I'm sort of modulating up, up my list here of five things. If you're watering the plant and you think the plant is right here where you put the seedling into the ground and maybe you're maintaining a, a moisture zone that's you know, three, four, five, six inches wide, but the next plant is what, eight feet over? And a bunch of spots in here are dry, they're powdery, it's dirt. The big plant should be being fed from a big root system covered by all kinds of microbes. But if you've only got moisture here and not here, then you don't have microbes being alive feeding the plant. So you, I mean, this whole concept of watering the plant or feeding the plant, I mean, you gotta get it out of your head. You're not raising plants. You're supporting the microbiome, right? The field, the web, the, the, the mycorrhizae, like there should be no, no point at which the roots and the microbes are not connected with each other across the field, right? You want a, a, a living web of life in everywhere. Like you do not want to have plants here, dirt here, plants here, dirt there. You want to maintain it across the entire ecosystem. Nature does this. Um, I'm going to take a not small tangent and talk about the seedlings that you put into the ground. Um, <clears throat> talking about tomato plants and transplanting them in. Uh, um, so we, we farmers, we, we, we vegetable producers, uh, do this thing in the springtime, many of us. Um, well, first we buy seeds. That happens in the wintertime, usually. Uh, then we buy potting soil. Hopefully it's soil, not sterile media. Anybody hear about this thing, sterile media? What does that mean? Sterile? We promise you there's no life in this. Like, we guarantee you there's no life. Anybody who thinks that's something to be proud of is somebody you should be really not listening to or giving money to, to feed your babies. Um, 
So we buy the seed, we buy the potting soil, we buy the trays, we buy the lights. Um, so I'm going to just walk this through with you. Um, plants, uh, when they germinate, well, I'll, I'll go back one step. Anybody know what pigweed is? Pigweed, redwood amaranth. Uh, how about how about um, 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 lamb's quarter? You know what lamb's quarter is? Some people know what it is. Don't know what it is. What's that? Straight FPJ. Okay. Pigweed. If you know what pigweed is, pigweeds are just a you know it's it's a it's a it's a good solid respectable plant. It grows vigorously. You know it'll you know in the right environmental conditions it'll be six eight feet tall, broad, you know, covered with whatever these combs, seed heads by the end of the growing season. Actually, um, if you've ever seen a, a, a pigweed that germinates in the end of May or beginning of June. Um, if let be, will be this six foot wide, eight foot tall behemoth, really amazing plant, right? Like, wow, well done. Um, that same pigweed that germinates in the garden in August by the middle of September will be, you know, yay tall. It'll have put out its seed heads. It's combs. It'll be. It'll be. It'll have gone through reproductive phase. But it's six inches tall instead of six feet tall or eight feet tall. Now it's not like we got different varieties of pigweed in the ground in the garden, right? There's like the spring germinating pigweed and the fall germinating pigweed. No. What happens is when they germinate, they tune into their environment. They say, "I'm going to look back into my last, you know, ten thousand generations of genetic memory." And I'm going to read, is it, are they long days or short days? Are they warm nights or cold nights? When did the you know, spring equinox happen? When's the summer solstice? Well, how soon till fall equinox? Right, plants read the environment. How much space do I have? Are there you know, 10,000 of us germinating within a you know, two square yard area? Or is there not much, not much around? How much? You know, am I, am, are we like locked up and sitting in chairs in a room all lined up still because there's not much space to move? Or are we, have, are we able to roam and, and, and expand? So um, the, the people that study corn and things like this have really dialed it in. I'm not sure where the marijuana community is at by looking at this thing, but first leaf phase and second leaf and third leaf and things like that. Um, really early on in the first you know, few days, 10 days, the plant has taken a, a read of the environment and has, has tuned into you know, what it can likely accomplish in this incarnation, in this, in this, this current lifetime, you know, in relation to the past 10,000. And it, it makes decisions about how to build its body based on that early read of what's going on. So I like to use the example of onions because here um, in New England, a lot of farmers will be starting their onion seedlings all around now, February 15th. Yeah, pretty classic time to start your onions. Um, you know, I'll just do a quick picture here. Um, people have heard about the cell tray. Right, so just going to go with cell for a second. C-E-L-L. -L. Um, like, if you're in prison, you could put in a cell, right? So we're putting our plants into cells. Here we are, February 15th, put my onion seed in. February 18th, the first little root comes down. February 20th, the first root comes, this leaf comes up. 22nd, some more roots go out. 24th, more leaf goes up. 28th, the plant has found the edge. It has assessed the soil. It knows what's in it. It knows how much space it's got. Oh, I'm all by myself. I got no community. Right? <laughs> what was that? What was that movie? Um, Mars. Remember that guy he was stuck on Mars and all by himself? Like, there's no people. There's no life. I'm alone. Which is not the best kind of environment to be raising children in. Um, thinking about your plants as children, but I haven't gotten there yet either. Uh, at two weeks old, 
this plant says, I've got a cubic centimeter of soil to build my bulb out of. Now, my genetic potential is to have a one pound bulb, but the likelihood of me being able to pull out a one pound bulb out of one cubic centimeter of soil is not. So I'm gonna begin defining downward my genetic potential, what I'm gonna realize in my body this lifetime. Um, the pigweed does it when they germinate in, in August, they say, there's no way I can get to be six feet tall before frost. So I'm gonna get six inches tall and set my seed. Um, so when you start your, your seedlings in these environmental conditions to get a jump on the season, which is always the story, to get ahead, um, I would say what you're doing is actually engaging in profound child abuse. Um, this is a baby who just got born. Um, what you're basically doing is sticking it in a crib. I like to think about life cycle, like birth is germination, you know, transplanting out is, is kindergarten, um, flowering and fruiting is puberty. Um, let's, if we understand the cycles of life for animals, relatively intuitively, um, those are basically exactly the same cycles of life for, for plants. So we talk about, you know, in this Western culture, needing to study and learn science and things like that. We also understand that indigenous cultures globally were able to work much, very well with nature without any of this science stuff. And part of it might be their ability to intuit and, rep and understand patterns. And we do understand from the science that these life cycle processes are actually remarkably similar. Um, so, so you stick your, you stick your seedling, your seed into this, into this little cell, cell tray and you keep it there for six weeks. Um, and then you put it into the soil. Um, and what does that root system look like? Right. As above, so below the balance Right. What you want is those roots never to reach an edge. Like you want your child never to reach an edge. You want that child to be so supported. I'm not sure what that, I guess nobody can control that, but um, you, know, you don't want your children limited and restricted and controlled. You want them to be free to realize themselves and to explore and to grow and to have different experiences and to you know, deeply tune into their true natures and their full capacities of being. Um, and if you were to take that child and you were to stick it in the crib and give it, you know, uh, um, formula and change its diaper, but not do anything else for the first five years of life, you'd have a pretty screwed up kid going to kindergarten, right? Social skills, language, intuition, symbiosis, Right? I mean, the, the early childhood development is this critically important stage in life where, where you know, we're, we're, we're born, they say we're, we're plastic, our brain is plastic. And by plastic, they mean it's, it's, it's like, you can learn to speak English, or you can learn to speak Chinese, you can learn to be a Christian, you can learn to be a Muslim, right? You, I mean, we're all born with the capacity to modulate into our environment, to fit into our environment, based on what environment we grow into, but then, it's hard to learn language, right? When you turn five or you turn 12, it's hard to learn languages because that, that stage, that early childhood development stage has been passed and you're on to reproduction. And you got the body you got, you got the psyche you got, and life's gonna be keeping going through its cycle. So, um, you know, I would suggest that it's critically important to understand these things, understand the, the, the importance of this stage of the life cycle, I said this is gonna be a bit of a, of a tangent. We were talking about water, I think, and now we're talking about you know, babies and um, traumatizing them. Um, it's strategic if your objective is yield, not to inhibit, right? Anybody ever done this with tomato plants where they, they started the tomato plants early? They, whenever they were six weeks old, eight weeks old, when they put them into the ground in the end of May, and they're maybe, you know, whatever it is, six inches tall, and they got this puny little root system. Anybody ever done that? Right? Maybe you, you, you bury the stem, 
because the roots ain't never going to work like they should. So maybe you'll get some new roots to come out of the stem. <laughs> but about that time of the year is when the tomatoes that fell on the ground, whose seeds were still there, start germinating. Everybody ever seen that? About that time of the year, if you're paying attention, if you had tomatoes around there last year, you see them germinating. And say you just let one of those be, right? So that one's just like two cotyledon leaves. And this guy's, oh, that's six inches tall. I got to jump on the season. <laughs> Check back in August 15th. And the one that you're so proud of has been eaten alive by a flesh eating fungus. Right? Maybe squeezed a couple little fruits out before it just gave up the ghost. But you bought the seed and had the lights and had the trays and got the best potting soil and you know what you're doing. And the one that nature germinated two months later where the seed fell is eight feet across. Green leaves, bottom to top, bottom, not top, bottom to top, full of fruit. <laughs> There's a lot of things that are similar with plants and animals. There's a couple that are different. One is pituitary. Animals have pituitary gland that basically regulates your growth. So you can't have babies, you know, when you're five years old. Plants do not have a pituitary gland. Their growth is regulated by environmental conditions. So people are always talking about, oh, it's too long of a growing season, blah, 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 blah. We can see with the tomatoes, it's not an 80 day to trans from transplant till fruit because nature does it in 65 from germination in the field every year. So if Johnny says this is an 80 day from transplant variety, and nature says, this is a 60 day from germination variety. Why do you listen to Johnny's? Right, I mean, there's all kinds of excuses why we do things, right? Well, it's the season's not right here. We have to do this. I, I'm not sure I agree with you or that position. Um, but this was all going back to the point about the irrigation line. And when you start with the tomato seedling that's put in with, you know, this childhood trauma built in. It's got a very small root system. It's, it's turned in on itself. It's never actually going to be able to reach out and have a four foot wide root system because of all the trauma that you have imposed upon it early in life. So I guess maybe it's fine to have the irrigation line. And you know, what happens when you don't have that, that big root system with the microbes that's actually able to cycle all the nutrients and provide the things that the plant needs? Um, what happens? There's this thing called um, early blight. Um, it's a disease and it's endemic. Um, people may have seen it uh, that the bottom leaf on the tomato plant will start to turn from green to less green and then it'll turn to yellow and then it'll turn to brown and then it'll fall off. Have you ever seen that happen on a tomato plant? Um, people call it a disease and they go in there and they pull the bottom leaf off. Oh, it's a disease. We got to clear out the disease. And what happens next? The next leaf. And then you pull that one off because you're supposed to, right? And then what happens to the next one? Right? It just goes up. People will have, you'll see people with like, you know, tomato plants in a hoop house at 10 feet tall and they're naked, right? Their stems up six, eight feet. They're just stem because they took all the leaves off because they were being managing proactively to control the disease. There's this thing um, called um, pregnancy. Um, People have heard about it. Um, if you've ever been in the presence of a pregnant person, lived or been a pregnant person yourself, maybe you understand the critical importance of maintaining food. Um, they say, and I think it's true when we have experience about it, that when a woman who's pregnant does not get the nutrients that she needs for her baby to grow well, her body will take the nutrients from her body. Right? The calcium is pulled out of the bones, pulled out of the teeth. In the olden days, they would say, for every child, you lose a tooth. Right? And they used to have six, eight, ten kids. You know? And they didn't necessarily have a full diet, balanced diet. It was just, a, it was just a, the way it was. For every child, you lose a tooth. Right? Your body sucks more calcium out of its bones to make sure your baby has capacity to, to have its best chance. Um, 
This is what I understand has happened in three plants. Sometime in, you know, end of June, beginning of July, starts to get hot and dry, has to wait for a week. Soil starts to turn into dirt. That's when the bottom roots start turning yellow. What's going on is she's hungry. Because the has, there's no water in the soil, because the microbes are shut down, because she's not being fed, she's a pregnant woman, she's sucking the nutrients out of her bones, she's sacrificing the proper body she can afford to sacrifice the bottom leaves. She's sucking the nutrients out of her bottom leaves. It's not a fungal disease. The fungi are coming in to break down, to digest that dead plant material. When she sucks the electrolytes out, the potassium and the magnesium out of the leaf, it becomes electrically dead. Those fungi are just doing nature's job of breaking down dead material. It's not a fungal pathogen. It's, you know, a hungry mother. Um, I think a lot of the things that we call diseases are actually symptoms of, or, or, or results of bad food. Right? We are just doing a bad job taking care of our babies, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've got a couple of rules on my farm. Uh, one of them is, thou shalt not kill an insect. Another one is, thou shalt not kill a disease. And another one is, thou shalt not have nitrogen. But, um, let me talk about passing disease pressure, because I think I started here, because I was given the, the word before I started, that some people here are afraid of disease. That's um, a really um, perverse perspective. You have to fear, we understand. Is a perverse perspective. Yeah, I mean, if you look at how you know machinations of the culture are used, uh, using fear to control us and to disempower us. I think it's a, it's a profound duality. Using the love, there's love on one end and there's fear on the other. And so, if you're operating out of fear, you're not in a place of love from a foundational standpoint. So, uh, the metaphor I use to convey this point is. Um, when you walked into this room this morning or yesterday, walked in, uh, perhaps you uh, saw a chair instead of sitting on it. Um, if there had been a bale of hay where the chair is, perhaps you would consider sitting on that. I doubt you would consider eating it. You hear that so far? Mm -hmm. If one were to have walked a cow in here, she probably would have seen that bale of hay as food. Right? Are you looking at that? So, um, we know cows can digest hay, we can. We know cows have four stomachs, we know. We know the four stomachs has something to do with the fact that cows can digest hay, we can. And we're okay with that. This is just, that's a thing, y'all, from our local people. Cows have a different digestive tract than we do. They, they can digest different compounds than we can. Um, if you're okay with that concept, let's go back to the Colorado potato beetle from, this, from the beginning of the presentation or conversation, or monologue, I guess it is mostly. Um, um, the Colorado potato beetle larvae does not have a liver. Uh, it does not have the enzymes in its gut to digest protein. Doesn't. No big deal. We can't digest hay. They can't digest protein. Everybody's got their own digestive system function. Um, We are wired as animals with a very sophisticated um, nutrient monitoring system. 30% um, of our DNA is used in the function of our nose and our tongue. And you got a bunch of stuff going on in your body. But 30% of your DNA, a third, is, is associated with the use of your nose and your tongue. Nature thinks smelling and tasting is really important. Um, it's, again, back to the terpenoids and the alkaloids and the phenolics, the plant secondary metabolites, the medicinal compounds, flavor, aroma, is what our noses and tongues are tuned to. I haven't talked about frequency yet. We'll hopefully get to that today, but maybe not. Um, we are tuned to these things. Anybody had the experience of um, eating a tomato from the grocery store around this time of year? Well, they call it a tomato, but you know it's not because you have a tongue. Um, but you believe it is because I said it is, and it looks like one. So there's a, there's a, there's a, 
I'm told this is true, but I'm sensing this is true, but I'm a Western rational person, so I do what I'm, I believe what I'm told, not what I sense. I mean, we can get back, that's a whole exciting conversation there. Um, um, those plant secondary metabolites, those big complex compounds that are flavor and aroma, we talked about the 24,000 element compound, right? That's a big one. The larvae, for the larvae, that's like the hay for us. They, we, they can't digest a polyphenol, a, a terpenoid, an alkaloid. They actually can't even digest protein. So we got, we got, we got, we got pests, they're called. Um, there's the soil-borne pathogens. There's the rhizoctonia and the pythium and the alternaria and the verticillium. These are pretty relatively rudimentary organisms. They don't have a very sophisticated, quote unquote, digestive system. They can't digest carbohydrates. So when your plant is going through the process with the enzymes, with the elements, with all the rest of the stuff of taking the simple sugars and turning them into carbohydrates, it becomes indigestible to verticillium, alternaria, pythium, the quote unquote, soil borne pathogens, because they don't have the digestive system function to, to to break those compounds down. So when your plant is building those things in it on the way to building terpenoids and alkaloids and phenolics, it becomes indigestible to them. Larvae can't digest protein, so when your plant is able to complex the amino acids and convert them into protein, it becomes indigestible to larvae of all sorts. They all have the same similar digestive system function. Um, people have heard about fungal pathogens. We've heard about blights and mildews. Yeah, heard about those? Anybody here? Fungi, when, you when your plant is building high levels of lipids, those fats and those oils, it is physiologically indigestible to that type of pathogen. Physiologically indigestible. Like they can't digest it with the cow, the hay, us. When the beetles are the, the pest, the pathogen, uh, this has the most sophisticated digestive tract, and they can't digest the, the, the secondary metabolites, the terpenoids and the alkaloids and phenolics. So, so I like to say nature's giving us a report card, whether we want it or not. Um, um, if animals are your pests, if, if rodents, you know, raccoons, uh, deer, if animals are your pests, if they're coming out of the woods, to eat your field, that's nature telling you you're producing animal food. And then, and only then, should you be considering that you're producing animal food and then you should pick it and feed it to your children or to your customers. If nature's sending out beetles, she's telling you you're producing beetle food and that's not animal food. If she's sending in fungi, she's telling you you're producing fungus food Right, go down the chain. If, you're, if she's sending in larvae, you're producing larvae food. If she's sending in slow-born pathogens, that's, what, that's the level of biochemical complexity of what you're producing. You are producing what is happening. Nature's doing the best she can with the environment you've given her. So um, that's why I don't kill insects, I don't kill diseases. If there's a fungus at eating my plants, then in good conscience, I should not be providing that to an animal, right? They call it a tomato in the grocery store, but you know it's not. That's not, I mean, there may be some rudimentary elements in it, rudimentary compounds, but it is not what our body needs to flourish. Anybody who's had a peach off of a tree that was ripe and had that experience and flavor knows that that is different from what they call a peach that is purchased, if one does, off the shelf in the store, right? Carrots, milk, there's flavor, and then there's like what your experience is after you've eaten it, right? When you, when you ingest something, you got this really sophisticated <laughs> feedback loop called a body. You feel, oh, afterwards. That's what it was. So anyway, um, the point I want to make here about diseases and pests, um, which I'm guessing it's more of a disease issue, but I guess there's things like, um, what is it? Um, the little guys, the uh, aphids. I've been told sometimes people that are growing pot struggle with aphids too. That's so, okay, perfect, awesome, sweet. So, um, 
as I said, my experience as a farmer was that it was just normal that our crops got attacked by insects and diseases every year and we had to keep replanting them and doing things to address those things if we wanted to get a crop. And what I'm saying is, if we're getting a crop that's digestible to those things, it sh we shouldn't be harvesting it. That's not fit. To, it's not fit. Um, and, but people do. They have organically certified insecticides and fungicides, and they have not organically certified insecticides and fungicides, and that's just normal that people kill these things to get the thing to market. Um, it costs money. It's a pain in the butt because your yields are inhibited because you're always fighting these things. So my, 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 my comment is the more you are able to manage the environment for life to function well, the more this happens naturally. And that's my, my experience as a farmer is, you know, when you've got it and not even that dialed in, you're just doing a couple things better. Like you're finding, okay, we're stopping them from dying for lack of, lack of oxygen. So they're at least not dead from that. And we're stopping them from dying from lack of food. So that they're at least not dead from that. Like I'm not sending things to labs. I'm not looking at microscopes. I'm not reading books. I'm not, I mean, I'm just saying, okay, it's dry. Make sure there's enough water. It's, it's, you know, tight, make sure there's enough air. My experience is when you provide these conditions, when you ensure these conditions, that's when you can stand back and not worry about it. And so, um, there, uh, I've got a little bit of time left till 11. How much? Not, not much time left till 11. Um, let's get back on schedule and say it's break time. And was it 15 minutes or something? 15 minutes, 11, 15. They say if you're gonna, yeah, okay. <clears throat> the next town over from you. I grew up in North Brookfield. Okay, beautiful. Hey. <laughs> Good to meet you. Farmer myself, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You still live in North Brookfield? No, I live in West Warren now. Okay. The town's older, yeah, so yeah, not yeah. Too much from the area, so nice, I'm nice. Same, same region, so nice to meet somebody local. And, yeah. You know, it's good stuff. <laughs> good so I have one thing that you're probably I was, I was making notes back there. I'm like, do you want us to ask questions when they come up, or um, want to wait? Uh, I mean, I usually actually am a very interactive. I don't even start until I have questions for ten minutes. I'm watching you rocket over here. <laughs> oh I'm watching you back no, there. I, I, she's I like up so and down. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And you know all the points. I just want to check and see if the recording's happening or not. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> um, I don't think I said it, uh, but I've been um, working um, on this question of, of nutrition and nutrient density is a term we've helped to coin and popularize uh, for the last 10, 12 years now. Um, I work uh, for an organization called the Bionutrient Food Association. Uh, our mission is to increase quality in the food supply. Um, and uh, there's a lot we're doing with, uh, with the movement. And we've got a little spectrometer, a little handheld um, flash of light meter. Um, it's proof of concept right now. It's pretty rudimentary, but I think the implications are quite significant. Um, I could go into a full hour and a half or two hours on that topic. I'm not going to right now because I don't think that's the agenda for this conference. Um, but I do want to say that is, you know, um, part of what I'm up to and doing. And if people do know about it or have questions about it, I would say feel free to, to bring that up as well. But um, really, as I understand the intention of this event, it's really to, to support growers in doing a better job in working more well with nature. So um, just, I don't think I got to that point when I was doing my personal introduction. Um, so that being said, I saw a couple of hands go up quick over here. Yeah, uh, the picture you painted with the huge greenhouse assembly uh, complex uh, chain thing was so beautiful. I uh, have built a greenhouse, uh, 30 by 70, and that was uh, really, uh, really stuck home for me. I was wondering, what do you like to use for irrigation in a greenhouse? Mm -hmm. um, would, would you prefer to completely hydrate the entire 30 by 70 you know, square foot area? Yeah, so um, good point. Um, I didn't fully go into my water points, but I'll, I'll go into them quickly. Um, so um, when I plant, 
uh, when I plant anything in the, gr in the ground, um, you know, like a seedling, like it's a tomato seedling or a kale seedling or whatever, um, I give my tomato plants five foot space, right? A tomato plant wants to be a decent sized thing, so why the hell put them on 18 inch centers and then have to prune all the time? Just give them the space to be their amazing selves and you'll do less work and get more production, is my experience. Um, so when I put my tomato plants in, or kale, I do kale on three foot centers because, you know, a kale plant, you know, a good, respectable kale plant's gonna be, I mean, they get up five, six feet, but they'll should reasonably be three, four feet by the end of the year, and wide, right? A foot and a half long leaf on both sides of the plant is three foot. And so they wanna be, you know, what is the nature of the kale plant? An eggplant, you know, can be six, eight feet tall. Pepper plant will be the size of a Christmas tree, right? A lot of these things, because we've traumatized them, we've inhibited them, we've squished them in, we've We've put them in school and put them in, you know, uh, cribs. You know, their full potential is never realized. And so, and so we, we think we're getting more yield by putting them tight together. Anyway, when I put my seedlings in, which is far apart, I always put drip tape down on my farm. Um, you know, I generally do a four foot bed. So I have a tractor um, that's got a, a bed former on the back of it. And, um, it's basically, that, what that means is a divot every four feet. So, so it looks like, it looks like this. It's a raised bed in that there's a divot every four feet. And that divot might be a, a foot wide, but the, and the bed's four feet wide. So on a four foot wide bed, I'll do three lines of drip tape. So I can keep the entire bed moist. Whatever it is, some drip tape's got eight inch, eight inch spacing on the hole. Some drips have got 18 inches. Some soil is sandy. Some soil is clayey. You know, it's the point is every piece of land is unique, and you're working to be able to ensure sufficient hydration across the entire soil profile. I'll always mulch the, the pathway, um, keep that covered. Um, Uh, if you're keeping the bed moist and the pathway's below it, it shouldn't dry out. No, I'm not okay with anything drying out. I want the mycorrhizae and, and the root systems to be communicating from bed to bed. I don't want there to be ever any spot where everything's not connected. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it rains a lot. Like, we'll get a tropical storm or a couple of hurricanes. You know, we get eight, ten inches of rain in a short period of time. And so being able to have extra water run off is why I want this divot. And I'll do it on the lay of the land. It doesn't have to be a deep angle, but you want to have some kind of an angle so you can get extra moisture out of the environment. Because if you don't, then you got water log. And then you got no air. And then you got suffocation and then you got death. So you want to have an infrastructure in place to address excess hydration. And then you want to have an infrastructure in place to address insufficient hydration, which is why I have the drip tape down. And I may not need to use a drip tape for months on end, but um, to be able to, if it's going to be a drought year, if it's going to be dry, you know, having the ability to put the water on is, is very helpful. I do uh, uh, a gravity feed system, so low tech, uh, look at the lay of the land, see where it wants to be wet. If you walk out in the middle of the night or you know 2 a.m in in um you know september and december and march on your land and you can see where the lay of the land is sometimes it's easier with a flashlight at night to see the lay of the land and see where it's moist where where when it freezes and thaws and you know the, it, it rains it snows and it rains and it freezes where does the water pool where does the ice form where in the lay of the land does it want to be wet where, is it wet and there, dig a hole. And in that hole, put a sump pump. And from that sump pump, go to a, you know, 325 gallon, you know, tote. And so you take your, I mean, we're talking low tech, right? Like why spend money on stuff? I, you don't need fancy stuff as far as I'm concerned. So that's what my system is. Um, you look at the lay of the land, you work with the water of the land, and you have the capacity, if necessary, to add moisture to the field, but you shouldn't need to. So just as a, this is actually a very important point, 
Um, there's this thing, if you head east uh, over to the edge there of the continent, and you stand right at, right, right, right at the edge, and you stand there for long enough, you'll see the water comes up and goes down, right? If you stand right on the edge and you're in your ankles, and then it goes up to your knees, and then it goes back down again. Heard about this one? Tidal force, they call it, gravity, moon, sun, something or other, every couple, couple you know, twice, t twice a day, um, does not just happen in the ocean, right? Tidal force, gravity, does not stop at the edge of the ocean. Um, it applies on the whole, you know, the whole thing here. Um, my understanding is that uh, the tidal force will bring water up from the subsoil through capillary action into your root zone and then bring it back down again twice a day. So in the olden days, nature had this whole thing figured out with the irrigation. Like she didn't need pumps and tubes and plastic and money and electricity and if you don't have subsoil compaction, if you don't have a plow pan, right? You know what a plow pan is when it's really tight? You guys don't farm outside, you do inside stuff. No, I'm sorry, I'm being disrespectful. Um, okay, you know what a plow pan is, right? So based on how the soil has been treated in the past, sometimes there's an area at six inches of depth or at two feet of depth or at 12 inches of depth where it's really, really tight. The soil is really, really tight. And um, capillary action, you know, like if you take a, uh, you know, you, spill some water on the table and you take a, a like a piece of Kleenex or tissue and you you put or a, 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 a cloth and you stick the edge of it in the water the water will move through capillary action right it'll it'll get the whole paper wet that's capillary action that's horizontal um so the soil is a structure of soil will be like that and the gravity of the moon or the sun pulling the water up through capillary action from the subsoil, will water your plants from below twice a day. And there's a minor point here, which is that as the pore space is filled with water, then the air space gets pushed out. So the microbes, remember, are breathing oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. And so you gotta circulate the air, right? Because if you get a uh, if you close the doors and we all breathed in here for long enough and it was just carbon dioxide and nothing, no oxygen left, we'd all be dead. So think about it from the ground perspective. If the microbes are all down there doing their life and everything else and they're all breathing out, breathing out carbon dioxide, at some point they're going to run out of oxygen. That's going to be a limiting factor. So what nature does is she pushes the carbon dioxide up out of the soil into the air, which is breathed in by the <laughs> leaves. And then the leaves are emitting out oxygen. When the water table goes back down again with the tides, she sucks the oxygen back into the soil. So ideally, that's how you water your hoop house, yeah. is you maintain the water table, which means you have to look at the lay of the land outside the hoop house. And the permaculturalists talk to us about stockpiling water on the land and pools and ponds and gravity feed. You know, in a drought period, you're going to find if it doesn't rain for a couple months or weeks or six weeks or whatever, um, oftentimes the crops in the garden are struggling. They're wilting and things like that, but the, but the grasses in the field are not. The trees in the forest are not. They're, they're green, you know, they're, maybe it's a little dry, but they're still trucking and the plants in the garden are not. Um, so nature does this, whether we like it or not. And I think um, we can work with nature to have less cost, more resiliency, um, but you do want to be able to maintain that water table because if the water table drops down too low, that's not going to work. And so that's where stockpiling water on the land, if you've got it. Um, I use a mini excavator. I love mini excavators. I'm not sure if anybody else is a boy who likes to play with toys or every now and then, or girl, gendered, non-gendered. Boys are the toys. It's got, a, it's got a rhyme to it. It's got like a boy toy, whatever. Sorry. Was waiting to get some pushback. Finally got pushback. I was, everything I've said all morning long, no pushback. That was, that was the first one. Um, see where the, see where the, where the sensitive topics are. So yeah, um, short answer, not, not short answer. Um, the, the sub thing was all very helpful too. And yeah. I have some irrigation set up. I just wanted to see maybe what I was missing. To yeah, to but the final point about when I plant is I put the seedlings in, give them plenty of space, put the drip tape down and then I mulch. So you'll have, when I get done planting my tomato patch, all you see is a big section of mulch 
because the tomato seedlings are short because they're only, you know, two, three inches tall because you always want the bottom to be as big or bigger than the top of the plant. So I'll just go on to this tangent here for one second. Sorry for the other questions, but this is, I think, an important point. Um, um, I, talked about, I talked about it to some extent. Um, there was a question that came up in the, in the, uh, in the break, and I said, ask me, ask me during, during this session. Um, we, we talked about the, the um, environmental conditions that the plant experiences early on, the early childhood development phase, and the roots, not, you don't want the roots to reach, a, reach an edge. Um, uh, there's this thing called SRI, System of Rice Intensification, or SCI, System of Crop Intensification. Um, basically, it's helped to dramatically increase uh, yields on, um, of staple crops from Morocco to Malaysia. You know where Morocco is? It's in you know, Western Africa, Malaysia is in Eastern Asia. There's a bunch of people that grow a lot, like rice and stuff like that. In between there, um, we've been able to average increased yield 2 to 400% when planting rice and things like that by instead of taking seedlings that are six inch six weeks old and putting them in on four inch center they're putting seedlings in that are two weeks old and putting them in a one foot center let me draw that on a map for you here or do you got that in your head draw it, please. <laughs> i'm gonna have to get a new piece of paper So traditionally, people start their seedlings. They want to get them a good start. So they start them early and they start them in a, you know, in trays or, you know, when maybe in India, they use like a, a, you know, a, a seedling area in the ground, but they're pretty tightly planted to each other and they get them up six weeks and then they take them and bring them out to the field and they put them in um, and you know, we'll call this um, four inch center. Four inch centers, this is a foot. <clears throat> so they'll put the seedlings in. Sometimes, because they read John Jevons, they put in two or three seedlings because biointensive, the more plants we put in per square foot, the more yield we're gonna get. Remember, everybody heard that story? So they put like three plants in. So anybody ever, you know, sat in a chair and told to shut up and listen for eight hours a day or six hours a day for the first 15 years of your life, <laughs> all lined up next to other people with no room to roam. Anyway. Um, uh, well, actually, the people do it afterwards. They, they do jobs and they work for money and they sit in front of screens and they live in boxes and it's a whole perverse paradigm that feeds destruction and inappropriate power dynamics because we don't understand that we're animals and belong in nature and should be, you know, having sovereignty and self-sufficiency and things like that. But um, don't get me started on politics or consciousness or strategy in the movement because we'll, we'll lose the agronomy track and, and have a whole another interesting and exciting conversation. Anyway, um, what this SRI or SCI teaches is um, Instead of putting in, you know, on four foot center, sometimes more than one seedling that's six weeks old, that has, as I said before, a, you know, a very, a limited root system. So generally the tops are bigger than the bottom. Um, what they do is they put one seedling in on a 12 inch center that's two weeks old. So this is it. They don't do anything else different. They just put in a lot less plants a lot younger. So what happens when these plants that have had their early childhood trauma happen is they, you know, they go through their life and they kick out a couple, a couple stems with grain on it. It's called a tiller. I think they call it in, in grain language. Um, you maybe get five or six tillers 
in each plot and you map it out and you got yield. What happens with these guys who went in young and never had any boundaries get into the ground in optimal conditions because I'm not putting them in early when the ground's cold because I'm not trying to get ahead of things. They're actually trying to mimic nature. It'd be like that tomato that germinated in the end of May like it should in the ground and never reached a boundary. What does that tomato actually do? It sits there for a while. It doesn't get big on top, but what's going on in the ground is it's, it's reaching out and it's reaching out and they're reaching out. Remember about the pigweed? The first couple weeks, it's like figuring out the onion. It's, it's figuring out what my environmental conditions are. This rice plant is reaching out and saying, ha, 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 ha. Oh, watch me. And literally 70, 100, 300 tillers per plant. The genetic potential, the inherent genetic potential has not been limited through traumatization of the child, right? That human is able to realize its full potential. It wasn't locked up and kept, sit down, shut up, do what I'm told. It was allowed to be in nature and, you know, with elders and animals and running around and climbing trees. It was able to realize its, you know, to tune into its deeper self and then become an adult that could fulfill a profound potential. So average yield increase here is 200 to 400%, like doubling to quadrupling yield is the shift from putting in younger babies farther apart, giving them some space. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was somebody else's question who was gonna ask me a question, but yeah. Is rainwater uh, collection legal in Massachusetts? If it's not, should you follow the law? <laughs> um, I know in some parts of the country, I've given courses out in like Colorado and they're like, oh, we're not allowed to collect the water that runs the lens on the roof. And I'm like, well, just because somebody decided that they had the right to make a rule that violates nature does not mean that you should follow the rule. There's this guy from out here. There's this, you know, this lake, this town, Walden Pond, you've heard of it, Thoreau, civil disobedience. You know, at some point it becomes, well, the truckers are doing this right now, right? At some point it becomes incumbent on us to, to do what we feel is the appropriate thing to do. And if we all stand up together, honorably, peacefully, honestly, yeah, sorry, so that was a tangent. Again, politics. Um, I, yes, it's entirely legal to collect rainwater in Massachusetts. My question is, have you ever had a glass of nice, warm, stagnant water? To drink. Anybody? Mm, all that really just quenches the thirst. It's been sitting in a plastic jug for a while. How does that, how does that like leave you feeling? All water is not equal, right? It may technically have the HOH like chemical structure, but spin, life force, prana, Chi, whatever you want to call it, right? There's something entirely different of spring water coming out of the ground than there is stagnant warm water sitting in a plastic tote. So, um, uh, yeah, irrigation is a whole topic. Um, anyway, yeah. All right, so I said at the beginning that um, the, the least expensive, best bang for your buck, least effort thing to do is to inoculate. I'll say that the most systemic, um, most difficult thing will take time um, and probably connects to 30, 40% of yield potential being lost is seed quality. Like the quality of the seed you begin with defines foundationally the potential of everything else that can happen. People have heard of this concept of like a, you know, um, I, mean, I mean, I'm not sure how to frame this exactly. I'll say it positively instead of negatively. Um, <clears throat> if a woman when she's pregnant is at peace, you know, is well fed, is um, in, in nature, in community, 
you know, she's likely to have a baby that does more well. Um, if a woman is stressed, if she's unhealthy, if she's not well fed, she's likely to have a baby that does less well. If you track it through the generations, if you have a mother that was born to a happy, healthy mother, who was born to a happy, healthy mother, and they had happy, healthy lives, the likelihood is that the great grandchild there, the great granddaughter is gonna be growing up to be a beautiful woman, right? To, to actually just be a full realization of that potential. Um, Pottinger's cats, Pottinger's cats, um, um, epigenetics it's called. Um, so it's a profoundly important piece of the puzzle. And you know, indigenous cultures globally, like a lot of them don't have books. They didn't have you know, Monet's and they didn't have cathedrals. What do they have? What was their, like, their cultural value they passed down? Seed. seed. They passed their seed down. The seed was the collected wisdom, the collective value, the thing that got, the thing, not, not music and story, but the thing. The thing of great sacred value and importance and relevance that got passed down was the seed. And that had been grown out in that land for generations. And they managed it and they selected it. And they didn't do one variety here, like we've got, you know, um, brandy wines here and we've got you know um i don't know thomas alls over there right they did what's called um land race i think is the is the technical term where they would plant all of the tomatoes or all of the wheat or all of the corn or whatever it was of all varieties together because they understand the value of you know cross-pollinization and that you know it's not hybrid vigor it's just when you have the opportunity of these different genetic lines to be constantly crossing and evolving, and then you're sensitively looking and, and, and selecting. You know, there's some crops that do more well in a dry environment, some do well in a cold environment, some do well in a... We want to be harvesting the seeds from all these, all these pieces of the range and then planting them all and letting them, you know, make babies together and selecting them I mean, there's a, there's a really, really, really important piece of the puzzle here, which is like, you can't just go buy that, right? There's certain things you can do, like you can get drip tape, you know, you can get inoculant, you can go out and harvest inoculant, you can do these things pretty quick if you have the resources and the focus. But getting three generations of, of healthy mothers behind the seed that you're planting does take time. So extremely important topic. Um, I hope I covered the point you wanted me to yeah, can you cover. So that whole thing, yeah, I'm not sure how it works with pot plants, but um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So the point, the story I tell sometimes I'm talking about seed is um, if you are, um, well, the way it works in the seed industry, uh, in vegetables and things like that is, I will take, I think I use the example of Thai spinach oftentimes, and that's a, you know, it's a hybrid, it's a, it's a, um, it's well-established, it's, I mean, I'm not sure if it's hybrid or not, but we'll, it doesn't really matter. Um, um, there's, I think it is because there's only two growers that grow it. Um, there. This is a, a seed that's owned by a company and is grown out by two growers in the Pacific Northwest. I'm not sure if it's Oregon, I think it's Oregon, where they grow it, grow it. Um, big seed farms. And when they harvest the Thai spinach seed, they, 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 they take it to, a, um, to get um, sorted and cleaned and things like that. And they have, this, they have these things called screens um, or gravity tables. But functionally what they do, the screen is probably an easier one to, to envision, is they've got a, a 12 screen, which has decent sized holes, and a 10 screen, which has somewhat smaller holes, and an eight screen, which has even smaller holes. And so they take, they dump all the seed out of the screens, and all the seed that doesn't fit through a 12 screen gets shunted off, and that goes back to the growers to use for seed next year. 
the stuff that doesn't fit to a 10 screen, um, the growers in the Salinas Valley that understand the value of seed quality purchase and plant. And then the stuff that doesn't fit to an eight screen, the growers that maybe are in New York State working on you know, acreage and are buying 50 pounds of speed at a time, they'll get the eight seed, eight screen seed. And the stuff that doesn't fit through a six screen is the stuff that will germinate. That's what goes into the packet trade. The packet trade is every single company that you can see that is selling seed. If there's only two growers on the planet that are growing all the Thai East Spinach seed, it's all getting selected and sorted. It doesn't really matter who you're buying it from because it's all coming from the same place originally. It's been marked up by middle people, right? That's how it always gets done. The farmer doesn't get much. The, the buyer's paying a lot, and most of the profit goes to the people in the middle. But what they've done is they've selected out the stuff that's got the best vigor and vitality. They've made available to you the things that will germinate. Um, so seed quality, if you've ever done this, if you've ever experimented, I, you know, tomatoes are a good example, but you can look, do other things. You look at some tomato seed in your hand, and you, and you look at that. There's some of them that are fat, Everybody seen that? Like a fat seed, it's got like a, it's got a curve to it. And some are flat. They're almost like indented sometimes. If you were to take your packet of tomato seed and put them you know, on your hand and select them out, fat ones here, flat ones there, and then plant the fat ones in this tray and the flat ones in that tray, you'll see these ones germinate day five, six, seven. These ones germinate day 12, 13, 14. These are the ones that have better vigor and vitality that grow taller, that are more resistant to, you know, late blight. These are the ones that have less vigor, that, are, that succumb more readily. You can do this just by looking at it on your hand. Um, if you are saving seed, if you're getting a, a full spectrum of seed in the packet you're buying. Um, so, yeah, it's a really important topic. And, um, um, you know, one thing you can do is you can, when you do plant all of your seeds, if you're planting a bunch of seeds and you're envisioning having this many seedlings, which I suggest you shouldn't do, um, is start them all out and see the ones that germinate first, pot them up right away. Um, the question about blocks, about soil blocks and, and potting up and stuff like that, air pruning. Um, you know, if you wanna start seedlings ahead of time before you go put things out into the field, fine, just let their roots never reach an edge. So if you know what those, those little seedling, those little uh, blocks are, those you know, the one inch blocks and the two inch blocks and the four inch blocks. Fine, start them early in blocks, block them up. The ones that don't germinate with it by day eight, if it's tomatoes, just take the ones that germinate first. If you like people do this thing with community gardens, I may hear about a community garden where they have like a little plot and then they sometimes get competitive with their neighbors and like my garden's better than your garden. So I suggest if you're in that kind of an environment, and operating in that kind of mentality, like a really good strategy would be to give to your competitor those seedlings which germinated second, <laughs> right? I mean, you're just putting a serious finger on the scale. Um, but if you're trying to actually do a good job with production and, and maybe start saving your own seed um, so that you can have better seed next year, um, these are the ones you would be selecting and putting on farther spacing. Um, so that's probably enough on the topic, yes? Yeah. And talk about things like mineral availability. Mm -hmm. For calcium to come off the line part, get onto a CDC uh, site in soil, it has to physically contact it. So if I have, you say, a client that has really acidic soil that needs lime, mm -hmm. the amount of time it would take for it to do that if you just surface apply the lime. Are you in favor of a tillage event to incorporate minerals up front and then letting it do its thing afterwards? Because we all know that tillage disrupts biology and we want to avoid that. Yep. However, I do think as much evil as conventional agriculture has done, there are some things that we can pull from it to improve our, our farms if we want to do things less destructively. Yeah. So uh, personally, when I started my farm, that's what I did. Um, I had an old rundown, worn out dairy farm, tight soil, goldenrod and, and you know, um, milkweed was what was growing there. If anybody knows what that looks like, like not good soil. Um, and I just took a bunch of minerals, spread them out, took a tiller out. Yeah, got it down a few, a few inches, made my beds, 
put my seedlings in, put the drip tape down, put the mulch down, and what was tight, crack, tight, hard, not dark color, no aroma, no earthworm dirt in like six weeks, eight weeks was night crawlers, you know, aroma, structure, soil. Um, so uh, one point I want to make is, you know, it's not hard to take what's in your backyard or in the back 40 and profoundly revitalize it. It does not take years, decades. If you understand what life needs, if you understand that life needs air, water, food, minerals, and she herself has to be there, and you can provide that environment, sunlight, warmth, um, you can profoundly transform an ecosystem. So, I mean, I'm, yeah, I don't, I do not subscribe to the thou shalt not till philosophy or, or, or dogma. I consider that to be a dogma. Um, I do think strategically it is something you want to be minimizing as much as possible. Um, if you're in an annual production system where you're, you know, wanting to convert from this crop to that crop, I have, as well as a, you know, a bed former behind my tractor, I've got a tiller behind my tractor, four foot bed former, four foot tiller. And I take that tiller and I drop her down meh, about an inch. First come through with a mower, the rotary mower behind the tiller, behind the tractor, mow, mow, mow down what was there. Next come through with a tiller, you know, disturb the soil by an inch. Next come through with my seeds, broadcast my seeds. Next come through with my rake, rake them in, water them. You know, within 48 hours, I've converted from four foot tall, whatever it was before, to a, you know, a bed of greens germinating and covering the soil. So for, for, for two days, there was bare soil there. And I did use a tiller, but I was able to practically use technology, infrastructure, machinery, metal, to you know, efficiently transition and maintain, I think, life in the soil to a large degree. So it's all about how you do what and when. Um, but yeah, I would generally say um, I'm not opposed to tillage. I do think, um, and what I generally do on acreage, so say you got pasture, say you got you know, 15 acres of, of pasture um, and you've got soil that needs minerals, I'm not gonna till that up. No, not at all. I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna get my minerals, I'm gonna spread them out there. I generally like to do it in the fall. Uh, hopefully I've got a good few inches of, of or feet of, of um, grass growing. When this, you know, there's minerals, rock dusts and things like that. Limestone is a rock dust, rock phosphate, green sand, you know, things like that people have heard about, they're rocks, um, uh, basalts, uh, azomite, there's all kinds of gypsum, carbonatite, there's all kinds of these things that have different minerals in them. Um, sea salt, I'll broadcast them out in the fall and my experience is the earthworms will facilitate their, their transfer into the soil. They, they'll, they'll, they'll eat them, they'll digest them, they'll poop them out. I don't, I don't agree that it would take hundreds of years for that lime to get into the soil colloid, that calcium to get into the soil colloid. If you're in a strictly chemistry environment, perhaps, but we are not in a strictly chemistry environment. We are in a biological environment. Life is the dominant paradigm. So my general philosophy is get into the environment, the things that we understand life needs and try not to screw things up. Like try to engage in as little destructive activity as possible, provide the environmental conditions, make sure you got mulch, make sure you got water, make sure you got air, make sure you got minerals um, and, and life will, do, will, do, will take care of it much more rapidly than I think many of us think is possible. Yeah. Yeah. How would, how would you, and starting something off, how would you mineralize that? Would it, would it be at a, a lower level? Or would when you say raised beds, are you talking about you know, people bringing in stuff in the back of a truck and, and building, you know, walls of wood or plastic and then sticking that in? And or that what I did, or so, or what I did here was raised beds. I call that raised beds. Yeah. So I call a divot from. every four feet a raised bed. Yeah. With non-native soil or a combination. Why the hell Just don't do it. <laughs> would you buy shit? buy shit, right? I mean, generally what they sell in bags is not, I mean, if you want to spend money, well, set yourself for, back. For, for Sorry. For you to know that um, a lot of cannabis is cultured and cultivated inside. Yep. And so, um, like California really is trying to push all the growers and cultivators into either standard agricultural type systems or in a lot of states inside entirely, behind lock walls, something that can be, yeah. you know, Yeah. You have to buy things 
So stop being so judgmental. I'll try not to be. I'll try not to be judgmental. Okay. Um, what's that? Well, no, but it's a practical. What she's saying is, it's a practical issue, right? A practical issue. Some people are not unable to work with the land, on the land. They need to. They, for every reason, need to be in an, that unnatural environment. Um, so, um, you know, I do think if you're going to be using you know, a potting soil, then oftentimes the compost-based potting soils are the things to work from. Um, compost is, you know, a, a, an accomplishment. Just because you put some organic material in a pile and turn it a couple times and then put something in it does not make it compost. It can oftentimes be putrefied organic material, right? It's, a, it's an accomplishment. And you want to inoculate that. You want to mineralize that. So um, there are companies that do a good job of putting rock dusts of various sorts into their compost piles. So that would be one practical thing, would be when the compost is being made to put the spectrum of minerals into it. Because rock dust is not bioavailable. It has to be digested by the microbes. Um, 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 soil itself is, what do they say? You know, a good soil is 5% organic matter. It's got some air in it, it's got some water in it, but mostly what is it? It's basic, it's that raw subsoil. So what I've experienced is when I'm out there with my mini excavator digging holes for the ponds to make the streams and you know, have fun, is I'll, you know, I'm digging down, we're, so we're going down. We're making, you know, this is a swimming hole, right? I mean, you're diving, or this is not just for irrigation, this is for quality of life purposes. Um, so that means in some cases you're bringing out a bunch of subsoil and you, you know, it's a, whatever it is, it's a, uneven area with rocks because around here in New England there's all rocks all over the places and so you, you take that subsoil and you spread it out so you can actually you know have it be like it's going to be a lawn in a couple of years next to the pond um, it's subsoil right there's no color it's yellow it's not but next year it's not yellow it's brown and the next year for that it's black all soil is is subsoil that plants have been able to act on I, I want to take this picture, just bring it back up because I'm not going to use that one very often, but I can use this one. When you're making the sugar and you're injecting it into the soil, you're taking the carbon out of the atmosphere, you're putting it into the soil, you're building organic matter. So foundationally, soil is just this sand silt clay, this, your subsoil, with having been acted on by life. So uh, depending on your strategy and your time frame and your costs and your you know, we built this building and it cost a million bucks and we need to get turned around immediately, then maybe this isn't going to work perfectly well. But I think as much as possible, being able to mimic this process, if you have to do it behind walls under a ceiling, um, you know, starting with that raw material, if you have to build a box, build the box. Um, ideally, keep it grounded in some way you can because this whole thing with the water coming up from below, I mean, there's some real important things with, 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 um, um, paramagnetism, you know, the energy that's flowing through the soil that the plants grow from, the, 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 the gravity, the, you know, the, the moon, there's, there's all these subtle forces that are actually active when you're connected to the land. That if, you're, if you've got one layer of um, foam underneath your cement floor upon which you built your bed, you're disconnected now from a lot of the energies of nature. And so drill a hole through the foam and stick a copper pipe and you know ground it if you got to cheat every now and then to connect those energy circuits just a little bit um so i'm not sure if i answered your question at all but um i do think um if we can establish this kind of a bed if you're in it for a couple of years um and you know putting in some of these raw materials that are oftentimes much less expensive start off with the top you know foot of of compost good compost or whatever um, but you want to be getting that, that whole living cycle to function. Um, it ends up being way less expensive. Um, and oftentimes, those mineral deficiencies that you don't have in your compost because you're not, it's not soil, 
it doesn't have that sand silt clay, it doesn't have that mineral base to work from. It's those mineral deficiencies which are causal in the disease function, which is why you throw away the potting soil in the first place. Right? People talk about, you know, we, and farmers talk about rotating crops because they're afraid of disease. And then we had cucumbers here last year, and the disease was there, so we're going to move the cucumbers over here. And then the disease, of course, <laughs> continues. But um, I'm guessing part of the reason why you throw away the potting soil is because you're afraid of all the mites that you've established in the potting soil? Is that right? No? It's Sorry? usually just out of nutrients. For other people that are, that are having those issues, it's just, you know, it's, uh, yeah, just like low nitrogen. It's just dead. Sterile. If it's a sterile media, that was your mistake in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Um, nitrogen, there's always nitrogen in the atmosphere, so you shouldn't, you know, if you've got a well-functioning biological system, your plants should be harvesting their own nitrogen. Um, too much nitrogen is the cause of these mite issues and things like that in the first place, right? It was imbalances of excess nitrogen. The, 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 the um, aphids, you know, classic symptom of excess nitrogen. Um, I think I said I don't add nitrogen on my farm. So, you know, getting, however, in whatever environment you're doing it, attempting to mimic the, the process of nature. I think I said at the beginning, what would nature do? Um, is the sort of the foundational idea. I hope I'm addressing people's issues, but maybe you're not. Um, so, uh, in, in a situation like what you described before, where you made raised beds, uh, there was tillage done, or even yeah. once you've established it, you're no longer tilling, yeah. what's your preferred method for weed suppression for the grasses? Um, so, weeds, um, when you lay down six inches of mulch, um, there's no sunlight touching the soil. So anybody that does germinate can't see sunlight and doesn't make it through the mulch. Um, uh, when, so that's one piece. So the soil, when the soil is covered, you know, I mean, nature, like I said, likes to keep herself covered. When you till the soil and you uncover the soil and you actually shift the microbiome from a fungal dominance to a bacterial dominance, which is what most weeds is the gut flora that weeds like. So if you've got fungal dominance, the pigweed doesn't grow. If you've got fungal dominance, the lamb's core doesn't grow. Um, so a lot of the weeds that we have are nature's way of dealing with the fact that we just abused her. And she's trying to get the cycle back to that fungal dominant environment. So when you minimally disturb the soil because you didn't need to because it was aerated because you had mulch or cover crops from last winter and you just come through with a hoe and chop a hole every three feet to put your kale seedling in, there's minimal disturbance, so you don't have that microbiome shift from fungal to bacterial dominance. Um, then you don't have the weed germination to begin with in the first place. But keeping the soil covered is, you know, part of what nature needs to keep the soil fed. Um, so my, my strategy is minimal disturbance, maintain, maintain soil cover. Um, there are things like, like, like dock or, or, you know, dandelion or um, clover or uh, things like that that are I would call them not weeds, but nature's cover crops. Um, you know, one thing nature does is she does polycultures. You don't see monocultures in nature, right? You don't see all one plant growing here and only one plant. Um, every family of plants has its own microbiome, its own spectrum of species that it works with. We want as broad a diversity of species in the environment as possible. We want a, as broad a spectrum of plants in the environment as possible. Nature does not do monocultures, so we should be trying not to do monocultures. If you're growing a plant that's five, six feet tall, why the hell can't you have an understory underneath there? You know, dandelion is not going to bother a six foot tall plant. Clover is not going to bother a six foot tall plant. It's actually going to be symbiotic. So, so the question about weed, how we define weeds, not weed, but weeds, um, is, is a, an important one, I think. Um, um, I'm not sure if I, I think I covered the points I wanted to make. Did that cover your, address your question or? Yeah, what are the, what's the preferred mulch? Preferred mulch. Um, what do you have access to? In, what's inexpensive? I'm in Amish country, so plastic mulch is the way to go. So I would say mulch, um, if it's not natural, I wouldn't call it mulch, um, is the first place I would go. So, um, you know, leaves, hay, um, uh, you know, seaweed, uh, wood chips, um, you know, um, what, what costs not much? You know, in a lot of places, people take their leaves, like as I said before, off the land in the fall, put them in bags, take them to the dump. So, um, hey, I'll take them for free. You know, uh, you know I think um, sometimes there's you know, electric poles on the side of the road and there's trucks that come through every now and then and cut down the, 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 
the trees that are growing up by the electric poles and they got to dump that wood chip somewhere say you know give them a six pack and say hey dump dump it over here um, you know there's all kinds of opportunities for sourcing these ingredients from our local ecosystem i use mulch hay mulch hay is the hay that got rained on after it got cut before it got baled right you can't it's not fodder hay it's not feed hay anymore it's mulch hay so i get a round bale of mulch hay for 20 bucks you know you can get square bales for a buck two bucks depending on where you live you know meet the farmers go on craigslist think about it like i'm gonna need this mulch in june it's february it's already late i should have gotten it in july of last year right so stockpiling these resources on your land understanding what you're going to need to work through um leaves if it's leaves and you're getting them in october that's great um how big is your growing area i would just say whatever you're whatever you can access locally and inexpensively Um, in general, you know, they say that the, um, you know, the more, the, the, the smaller the, the diameter of the branch that went into the chip, the better the overall balance is. There's the whole carbon nitrogen balance thing. Um, a lot of people are afraid of putting wood chips on land and talk about, you know, nitrogen tie up and things like that. My experience is you can take fresh chips and you can put them on the ground. Don't integrate them, leave them there. The worms will work on them, put them down in the fall, let the winter work on them. Um, you know, if you are concerned about the carbon nitrogen balance, maybe you take some grass clippings or things like that. Um, but generally the, the Ramiel wood chips are the best, I would say. So the smaller branches, um, and you know, they've got all the, the, um, the xylem and the phloem and the, and the, and the, and the, the, the bark, the soft bark and the, and the leaves and stems sometimes. Um, if you take, uh, sort of, you know, brush in um, now, and it's dry, and it's it's not a lot of juice flowing through it. Cut it, chip it. That'll have certain value. If you wait until whenever it is May first, when the May fifteenth, when the leaves are pop about to pop, when the buds are about to burst, you take that same that take that same brush when it's full of all that juice, all that life force that got stored, those nutrients that got stored in the root over the winter. They're now in the stem. They're about to bust out. The buds are full. You take that, cut it, chip it, and use that for mulch. That's going to have way more value. Um, so how you harvest it, when, um, these are all nuances. Did it come from thick wood? Did it come from little branches? Um, th uh, those are, what's that? Hardwoods and softwoods, does it? Um, OK, I'm going to use this as an excuse to make a meta point, which is, um, why are you asking me? Ask nature, how do you do that? You experiment is one way, is you take some and you put it here. Your soil may have a really hard time with, with, with um, softwood chips because it's got certain dynamics. His soil might love softwood chips because it's got certain dynamics. Every soil is unique. Every soil has different historical experiences, struggles, conditions, and dynamics. So there's no rule of thumb you know, there's no like thou shalt or thou shalt not on any of these kinds of things. It really has to do with the dynamic of the land. Um, but the meta point I want to make is that um, there's lots of different cultures around the world um, that have been studied by our Western rational frame. Um, anthropologists have gone to, to Africa to study the Maasai and to uh, Australia to study the Aborigines and to South America to study the you know, people out of the Amazon. Um, and, you know, when they ask the people in the Amazon, say, for instance, you know, how did you figure out that this root and this leaf could be used to address this ailment or facilitate this state of consciousness or whatever? Because there's a bunch of different plants out there, right? How did you figure out these two together? Like law of averages said, you would have to do a lot of experimentation if this was just strict, like we didn't know what we're experimenting. Um, and they'll tell us, right? Not just the people in, in, in the Amazon, but the, but the people in Africa and the people in Australia, they'll say, well, the plants told us, obviously. How would you figure it out? So I would suggest that just because we, in this culture, have been taught that we, it's not even we've been taught that we can't talk to nature. 
It's just never even been a conversation. We've been taught that the answers are to be found in books and from people who stand up in front of you and tell you things. Then we sort of unnaturally, or sort of naturally or unconsciously engage in that model of, 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 of investigation. And so I would say that we are wired with these capacities for direct, direct perception and discernment um, that, that um, you know, many cultures tell us that this is possible. If you're a scientist, if you're going to engage the sort of the logic of the, of the scientific framework, truly true science, if you've got 15 data points that are on a line over here and you've got one data point that's an outlier, you know what happens What scientists do? They chuck the outlier. So you've got 15 cultures that tell us we can talk to nature and one culture that tells us we can't. If you're a scientist, you're going to say, I'm going to publish a paper with great statistical confidence that says we can talk to nature. And so I like to say, just on principle, and I don't want to sort of disrespect your question because I think it's a very important question, but is I'm not the one to ask. I'm, you know, I may have a couple comments and some, you know, whatever perspective, but the real answer is that in relationship with your plants, in relationship with your nature, then you, you, you discern what it needs now. And certainly there are meters and testers and labs you can use. There's also pendulums and, you know, dowsing rods. There's also medicine people, elders, you know, what they used to be called, witches, you know, uh, whisperers. Um, I mean, we all have these faculties. Um, some of us have them more, more or less well developed. I would, I would develop a relationship with one who has those and develop your own capacity there. So, um, all right, that was my, I'm glad I got to say that at least. I want to, I try to like to say that. Um, yeah. So, in this book, you talked about how you like to overwinter with mulch. What's your opinion about overwintering, you know, at scale in agriculture, you know, the 20 to 200 acre side? Um, yeah. Things like cover crops, like winter rye. Uh, superior. You prefer superior? Uh, Green is better than brown. Okay. Living roots in the soil as long as possible, as many months of the year as possible, and not only just rye, but as many, as many families of plants together as possible. Nature does not do monocultures, nature does polycultures. So what I do, you know, if I, if I mulch my tomatoes when I put them into the ground on Memorial Day thickly is because my soil has been eating that mulch by August 1st or August 15th, there's not much left. So I watch for a tropical storm to come through or a couple days of, you know, thunderstorms or whatever, and I'll take my cover crop seed, a, a spectrum of cover crop seed, not just one variety, and I'll broadcast that underneath the tomato plants and let the rain, you know, get the, I mean, you can even put them in a bucket and get them wet first, like fill the bucket with water for just even 10 minutes. Let them begin to soak up. Wait for the, you know, don't do this until the thunderstorm is about to come through. Get out there, spread the seed. They'll germinate. And by the time the frost kills the tomatoes, you've got three, four foot tall, massive, you know, variation, totally vigorous, vital cover crop growing. When the snow comes and lays it down, you know, kills it, whatever you can do. There's the overwintering cover crops and the, and the winter killing cover crops. So there's nuances there, but basically, yes. Um, strategically applying mulch on scale is not the answer. Strategically polycultures and cycles of polycultures is the answer to the degree you, you can pull it off. Yep. Yep. How do you think it varies in places where there is no winter to kind of kill down the, the cover crop? So there's no winter. So there's, it depends on scale. It depends on what you're doing. If you've got 2,000 acres and you've got oats and sheep, or you've got two acres and you're doing vegetables, um, you know, there's, there's the roller crimpers, um, so you can roll stuff and you can, there's the, there's the no-till drills, so you can basically seed. If you take a plant that's, you know, four feet tall, about to, you know, setting, setting seed, and you come over with a, with a roller crimper and knock it down and crimp it, you set it back hard. Even if you don't kill it, it'll set it back. But you can do a no-till drill, which is basically just like a little, it's just like a little, it just makes a little, little slice in the soil, drops the seed in, and that germinates and starts growing. You can basically, you know, go from one to the next to the next without disturbing the soil. There's a whole bunch of people out there that are studying this and practicing it. I was just in Montana yesterday speaking at a conference for people who were operating on this kind of scale, t doing this kind of stuff. So. Um, it's entirely plausible on scale to do this. 
Um, but if you're at you know one acre of vegetables, then you can use the occultation method, the 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 the, the, um, the tarps, right? You take the um, you know what, know about this um, big pieces of plastic basically, and you just lay it down on the ground. If you got a piece of plastic that's 100 feet long and 200 feet wide, and you lay it down on the ground, you put some sandbags on the edges of it. Anything that's green and growing there is not going to be because sunlight's necessary for things to green, be green and grow. If you if you know how long it's going to take and you know how tall things are, I want to plant my cucumbers here in three weeks. You take that you take that big piece of plastic, you lay it down. There's no sunlight. Um, there's heat, so it, things start to cook. You maybe put a little bit of sea salt or some molasses down to really kick the microbes into gear, and they'll take all that plant material and they'll digest it. They'll compost it, and you'll have an amazing seed bed with no plants growing there, just from laying the plastic down. So it depends entirely on scale um, and timing and season and things like that, and how far north you are, how far south you are. But the farther I was talking to this guy who's um, from Alabama, and he's got I guess the largest certified organic farm in Alabama. It's 6,000 acres. Um, and he has 20 acres of it that are vegetables, you know, mostly it's animals and, and things like that. Um, but he's got, this is what he tells me he did. He's got, you know, literally these, 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 these uh, silage tarps, they're called, uh, that they're 100 feet by 200 feet. So an acre is 200 by 200. So he lays two of them out next to each other on top of these ridiculously growing polyculture multi-species cover crops, four foot, five foot, six foot tall. Just take this tarp, lay it out, drop it down. And Alabama, it's hot, they don't have winter. You know, he knows the timing because it's his land and he's done it before. And three weeks later, he can go and plant his vegetables right in there. He said on all 6,000 acres, he does hundreds of acres of grain and dozens of acres of vegetables. It's 100% no-till, 100% no-till. Um, so, but it's with the combination of those tarps and with the the what's called no-till drills and the roller crimpers and things like that, that it can be done. Um, we've gotten away from the scale of indoor with lights, but I guess you guys are just following me on my track here. Yeah. Question. Um, you've been providing us a really great explanation of the legacy of listening to nature on a global scale. And it seems that in the few generations before us, there's been this growing disconnect how do you, what are some best practices or strategies to get the younger generations reconnected with this legacy curiosity towards nature to find this biodiversity? Um, get excited about it, as excited we are. You know, so, so children are, as I said before, you know, um, very sensitive to their environments. And they, depending on what the stories are that they're told, those become the stories that they tell. Um, so if you always tell them that this is what reality is and engage that way, um, then that's what they understand. And you can even go the other way with it and you can sort of make fun of people who don't think that way. You know, like if you are brought up in a church and you're taught that, you know, Christ is our savior and we, you know, are dismissive to people who believe something else. Right, this happens all the time. Um, um, so it's really about the story you tell and the life you live, the example you, you lead. Um, um, and I think also having elders, or if you don't have those faculties yourself, I mean, there are people who can do this, right? I mean, I, I consider it to be a muscle. It's a muscle, like you get really good at chucking a, you know, a, a, whatever it is, a snowball or a, or a baseball, you get good at it, right? You don't practice it, you, do, you don't know how to. You don't practice using your heart to commune with nature, you don't know how to. Um, so it's something that any of us can do and um, I think there's definitely plenty of books out there and there's plenty of teachers out there that are much more well, you know, suited perhaps than myself to, to give you answers. But it's just about doing it, just walking the talk and, and living the life, I think. Um, I, I, I um, talk about this when I talk about food quality, and I say, um, you know, various people are, are you know, generally happy to be dismissive about agribusiness and, and you know, Monsanto and the Farm Bill and, and you know, stuff like that, right? It's kind of cool in some circles to, to sort of look down on that. People 
other people that eat at McDonald's or, or whatever um, and talk about us and them and we're victims and we can't control the environment. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, we've got our votes in the ballot box, which you may or may not do, um, but most people do vote on a regular basis with currency, with dollars, energy, money, power. And so every time you put your energy into buying, you know, um, I don't know, what's an example? Uh, bread, you know, white bread, I, I don't know, corn, you know, something sweetened with corn syrup, uh, a processed product, they call it food, something with multiple ingredients on the label. Anytime you put money into that, you are putting energy into that reality. You are part of the problem if you define it as such. Every single time you put energy into that, right? 100% of the time, you are putting energy into it, you're making it bigger. And so, so the stories we tell, the actions we engage in, the, the life we live, I think, is, is functionally the energy we create, the world we want to see. And so, um, I mean, maybe that was a bit of a, a rant. I don't know why I felt like I needed to say that. But, um, you know, there, oftentimes there is this people come together around bad-mouthing others. Like, we, we virtue signal by talking about how we understand this, but other people don't. I don't really know how productive that is. It's maybe good to start with, but, but really I think there's another level of, of focusing on solutions as opposed to focusing on the problem, instead of focusing on separation, focusing on connection. And, it, and you know, there's a, I think the real power is with our intention, whether it's your heart or your mind or your gut or however you wanna, or all of them working together. Um, I think there's something really important there um, that we all can do much better with or about. So I've gone metaphysical here on you. Love it? Oh, it's got, it got quieter. Before it was like more energized, this, the first session. You guys are, maybe it's just, it's a different kind of energizing. <laughs> yes. You talked a few times about like uh, stunting a, an annual plant in like a container, whatever, it's seedling. Um, what's, the, what's your thoughts on, you know, what we do with cannabis in cloning annual plants? Does that epigenetic trigger reset once it's cloned into I now have space? Or do you think that it's like you're going to have to keep recloning it when it never gets root bound, put it underneath the sun, give it the perfect environment, and then it's reset? So epigenetics says that, you know, the environment, you know, determines the expression of the genes. And that environment is constant, right? Every day, every minute, the environment is affecting how those genes are expressing and it's modulating. Um, it's a fair question about the root system and not having a root system and putting one on. Techniques of like whether you're air layering or just cutting a branch. Yeah. Know, like at what point is that the, the healthiest, best way to propagate that with most vigor? It's a fair question. Um, you know, so when are indoors and we are trying to maintain decades old clones. Why? You know, why? For breeding purposes. It's an annual and if we want to breed with these things for the long term to repeat you know, but if you're cloning, you're not breeding. Preservation. Yeah. Preservation of the original genetics. That Why? Because it's exactly medicine. You might not you have headaches, one blood strain fixes a headache. You can't really risk it getting, like when you do genetic recombination, you're not necessarily going to find that same genotype. Yeah. You're not necessarily going to get that same headache relief. Um, so, you know, it's not just vegetable, right? It's a little more to vegetable is medicine. Careful. But I mean, I, I, I don't <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I'm saying just don't dis vegetables, as I was saying. Like seizure medication, I mean, we're really far down at what things like But, 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 but these, all these, you know, symptoms of dis-ease are, you know, the whole thing about treating the symptom versus treating the cause and understanding what the underlying dynamics are, I think, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, smacks of the reductionist paradigm to say, I'm focusing on a headache here, I'm focusing on, a, on something else here. I mean, I th if it's a fair and open question, uh, um, a conversation. Farmers, we're not really involved in the education of curing. We're involved in meeting market demand. And if so maybe that's, demand, maybe, you're, maybe you're just a, a corporate whore then. I mean, maybe, maybe you know. I'm a in my, in my own time privately, you know, so I but, Yeah. And a lot of times people just want to be hurt. A lot of times people want treatment, and a lot of times people want to cure. 
Yeah. With cannabis, it's the same scenario. Some people see it as a cure, some people see it as a remedy, some people see it as a treatment, and some people see it as recreation. You know? But to my mind, it's the, it's the, it's the breadth and the complexity of the compounds that, that really addresses the systemic issues, whether it's a headache or whether it's this you know, glaucoma or whatever it is, you know, it's the, the, it's the spectrum of nutrients and compounds is what actually at the root addresses these issues. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a specialist in the topic, so I, I may be off in left field, but you know, the first question I would ask is, why are we cloning in the first place? Why are we not? So, yeah. That. Testing, testing is incredibly stringent in a lot of states. If you have a percent of cannabinoids, yeah. THC, for example, yeah. if you have a seed run and you have, say, 100 plants, yeah. and one of them tests at 29%, and one of them tests at 25%, and one of them tests at 26%, yeah. those all have to be separate batches. Our testing in California runs about $650 to $850 per batch. Batch maximum of 50 pounds, but you can only batch within that range. So each plant is its own batch. Now I'm paying six hundred fifty to eight hundred dollars per plant just for testing. So, because but there's a, there's a financial but the but the management practices that go into the creation of the THC affect the level that that plant will make. If you take three clones and you grow them in different environmental conditions, right. you're going to get you know the fifteen and the twenty and the thirty percent. Yeah. But I make no money on that. That's mostly for my own personal pleasure. Most of that gets composted uh, according to the government because I can't sell it because of exactly like the economical reasons I just said. So for the market, we yeah. grow clones because they are close enough within range that I can have a 50 pound batch of all the, the same plants. Yeah. Right? And then you also have cannabis culture, which has a lot to do with uh, different cultivars, different strands. Yeah. So I hear, I, I get the concept, I get the concept, and the concept is basically... Yeah. So this sounds like, this sounds like, you know, um, the tomatoes that you get in the grocery store in January, you know, they're all, you know, a certain kind, a genetic that's good for shipping, that's, that's, that's been bred to be picked raw, you know, put in, a, put in a big truck, driven up here, gassed to turn pink, and put on a shelf, because the way the commodity system is, the way the, the, way the market works, is uniformity, right? You get hybrid, you know, squashes that have shit for root systems, but they all come in at the same time, and that's what you're looking for if you're operating on a, on a, a production scale. So if you're engaging in that market structure, some of these deeper conversations you know, probably just need to be put to the side. So I mean, if, you're, if, if that's what you're doing, if the, if the market that you're engaging in is limiting you in this really you know, profound way, then you have to do clones, and I, I don't. I mean, I just don't know. I've never done it, so I can't probably speak to that conversation. And a lot of times it's harvest time. Like if you have something that takes, you know, eight weeks versus something that drifts into eleven, that range can cost you, you know, quarter of your season to seven tenths, you know. All right. Because of the, the lack of commercial on scale for our crop, because it's illegal. So, so no, here's the, here's the thing, right? So, um, every plant's different. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to see this is 22, this is 24, this is 26. This is cannabinoid, this is al ter terpenoid, this is you know, whatever they all, there's so there's the different, there's the different kinds of high, right? One's the head high and the body high or whatever it is. Oh, there's a lot more than just that. Whatever. There's all these different things. There's a CBM, the CBG, the CBQ, whatever it is. The MBR. Right. So every one of those things, THC is a compound in chemistry. 
We talked about the compounds, right? Um, I don't, I said I, I, I referenced frequency and vibration. I didn't go into it. I said maybe we'll have a chance to go into it. Um, when I'm telling the story, I talk about Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is a star that's the closest one to us, which is not the sun. It's light years away, which is a reasonable distance, right? Light years is decent distance. Um, we have sent probes as far as things off of planet Earth that have gone as far as light hours away. The, the Voyagers kicked off in 77 are now 12 light hours away or so. They're past the edge of the solar system. Um, they haven't, they didn't stop at Venus. They didn't stop at, <clears throat> you know, Uranus. They took pictures of it on the way by. Um, if you ask an astro, astrophysicist, what is Alpha Centauri made up of? Not that you would, but if you did, they'll say, you know, 51% hydrogen, 48% helium, 1% other gases, these levels and ratios. We know exactly what Alpha Centauri is made up of. And that's the closest star to the sun. We know what stuff way past that's made up of. We're taking, we're assessing the, the atmosphere of planets hundreds of light years away, right? At this point, our, we're, we are so good, we can see like what the level of nitrogen is in the atmosphere of this planet. It's not a star. It's 250 light years away. Like I read that paper, I'm not sure, that news article a couple months ago. Um, how the hell do we know what the atmosphere is made up of on that planet 250 light years away? We didn't go there with a lab and test it, right? We didn't take the atmosphere to a lab and test it. We didn't take Alpha Centauri, a sample, to a lab and tested it. What we did was we took a picture of it. Every element in chemistry is a vibration in physics. Every compound in chemistry is a vibration in physics, right? We know about this, the protons and the neutrons and electrons. They, like, we, we're taught that a calcium is a thing, but we're also taught that it's always vibrating and spinning. You know, remember, like, anybody ever like give your teachers a hard time about that in high school? Like, I'm sorry, which one is it? Is it a thing or is it a vibration? The, uh, what the hell is reality? Oh, oh and the whole dark matter thing, like 96% of reality we can't find? Like, we know everything that is, and we know that 96% of reality we can't find. So, do we know everything that is? Um, anyway, so the point is, if we can take a picture of something that's light years away and know what it is by the vibration of the light coming off of it, then we should be able to take a picture of something a millimeter away and know what it is based on the light coming off of it. Are we okay with that conceptually? The science is called spectroscopy. Um, and this is part of the work that I do now that I'm more well known for than the stuff I've been talking about so far today, recently at least, is this meter. And the concept is, you know, that there's variation. I talked about, you know, tomatoes off the shelf, tomatoes from the garden, peaches off the tree, peaches from the, from the shelf. We know that variation in nutrients and flavor in our tongue actually correlates to health giving attributes and all these other spectrums of goodies and actually correlates to carbon being sequestered, actually correlates to soil being healthy, correlates to water infiltration, correlates to reversing climate, you know, global warming, we correlates to not needing fertilizer and insecticides and fungicides, correlates to farm viability being increased. Um, so our thought is if we can organize people around the inherent nature of the food as the thing they're choosing. So, you know, you got the bunny love and you got your calorganic and you got your Bolthouse Farms carrots, which one are you gonna buy if you buy f food, which people do. Um, let's let the nature of the food be the thing we choose. Like, not organic sometimes is better, sometimes it's not. Local sometimes is better, sometimes it's not. If we can support people in making purchasing decisions based, in, based on nutrition, that will not only help address their underlying dis-ease states systemically, obviating the need for agrochemicals, sorry, for pharmaceuticals, um, but it'll also create a reality where we don't need agrochemicals anymore because farmers are being incentivized to work with nature because that's the only way to get higher quality food. So this is all a, it's all open source um, in the commons, um, done, we've been working on this for years. I can go into this thing for a little bit more if you want me to, but I wanna answer this question. Um, there is no reason at all that, you know, next generation of this couldn't flash a light at every plant and tell you 22%, 23%, 24%. 
there's no reason why you couldn't actually, in real time, test ahead of time. So you can do your 50 pound batches if you want. You can, you, you know, you go there and you work with them and you, and you can see, right? I mean, this is, it's, there's no reason why we can't do this. We, 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 can, we, can, we can get beyond the boundaries we have right now. Just because we, we think we have to send things to a lab to get tested, doesn't mean we always have to send things to a lab to get tested, right? This, this, this whole thing with smartphones. Remember before smartphones happened? Most of us are more than 15 years old, <laughs> right? Right? I mean, the world is a different place because of the smartphone, right? Imagine the spectrometer, right? I mean, this is a first generation open source prototype that at a consumer price point where you can download the, you know, the specs and build one yourself if you want, because that's our philosophical framework. Strategically, I think there's some reasons to do it. But this is 375 bucks. You know, how much money are you spending per, per batch, per sample? So what's your net cost per year of sampling? Tens of thousands of dollars? Thousands of dollars? Tens of scale of grows in buildings around here in this state people are working i mean i'm not sure, i don't know the numbers but if you had a ten thousand dollar unit that made it so you could send in 50 pound batches instead of five pound batches you'd 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 you know recoup the money in a month right so i mean there's opportunities here i'm saying you know yes let's deal with reality as it is let's deal with the structure of culture and and regulations as they are, because they are what they are. Like we can rail against them, but we still are working within them. Um, you know, I'm pissed that I have to put shoes on to go into a store. But you know, I and I flew out to Montana and back, and I was pissed I had to wear a mask. But I did it, right? I'm philosophically opposed, but I will take part in the system because it's strategically in my best interest. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the end all and be all. So. Um, it's a good excuse to talk about this conceptually. Hope it wasn't too long of a digression. I've been following your, uh, your work on that for a few years, um, and I know that you've built a database of, of quality. You know, Variation, at least. Are there any plans to incorporate that style of machine into your program for cannabis? Um, as as building the database so source? how does this whole thing work open source? <laughs> Those who have interest support. We don't, we're not a company, we're a nonprofit. There is no IP, there is no control, there's no profit potential off of what we're doing directly. The concept of open source is it's in the commons available for everyone. Then therefore also, it must be built by everyone. So only when the community shows up with a million bucks to do the data collection, do we have the data set to calibrate the meter to to solve this problem systemically for everybody forever. Right? We're not talking about a bunch of money. A million bucks in this room? I mean, the people you know, the people you're working with? I, I, I'm guessing one step removed, maybe some people have money in their pocket right now. You know, how many people do you know? This could be done in very short order if there was a will to do it. Um, but you know, what we've been doing organizationally is saying, we're only gonna work with people who are gonna do it in the commons. If you're gonna proprietarily try to control it, knock yourself out, but that's not who we are. That's not our agenda. Our agenda is to empower the, the grower, period. All continents, all scales, all crops, all languages, all resource availabilities. This is for the global commons. This is not for investors with you know, money that are trying to get on the next fad. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, have you guys thought about doing something that is, because you can only pick the specific crops, right? So, so, okay, we'll just talk about the meter for a minute. I'll tell you right now, I'm talking to a lot of people about this thing, and I'm like, they're like, we use it on weed. I'm like, not really yet. So let me explain for the recording, for anybody who wants to be listening afterwards, what the deal is, how it works, what we've done, so we can answer this once and for all.
now organic selling out at Costco before the conventional. Yeah. People are going to say, I want this one. Why is it all sold out? Who's that farmer? How are they growing things? Everybody's going to follow money, votes, just like he was talking about earlier. So this is That's the prayer. That's the intention. I hope that I hope that what you just said is true. I intend that to be true. It'll only succeed if the collective accomplishes it. So, you know, the BFA is doing everything we can on donations, oftentimes on a wing and a prayer, you know, duct tape and bailing twine, much more than you maybe perceive from what you can see from the outside because of the fact that it is done with this ethos and we don't ask for money very well. We're like, if you think we're cool, you'll support us. And we forget to say, will you please support us? We just have lots of people who think we're cool. They're like, yeah, go Dan. And I'm like, hey, five bucks a month. What do you think? <laughs> um, so what's the deal? What are we doing? Um, the short answer, strategically, right? I, and this is a strategic act. This is a, a spiritual covert op is what I think of this is. I mean, and we can talk about the true implications of that. It will take a couple of minutes. I don't want to digress from agronomy if you want to focus on agronomy, but um, um, would you like me to go down that rabbit hole? <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's that? Whichever path. Uh, it's the one that's showing up in the moment. So, you know, it's a collective process. I like to ask for permission before moving forward, but um, sometimes at least. Um, just stepping back to the, for a moment on the vibration topic. Um, um, anybody here been to an elementary school band concert? <laughs> right, totally sweet, totally cute, but also grating on the ear. Um, that's, uh, we have in, in, in the, 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 the language of, of music, we call that dissonance. Also, you would call that dissonance in public physics, dissonance. Um, but you've been to the a cappella choir, the beautiful voices singing perfectly in tune, and you've heard the, the overtones. There's four voices and, and the fifth note, right? When things are perfectly in tune, the higher octave becomes manifest. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Heard about this? Experienced it? Have a, have a sort of intuitive understanding? Um, so those noises that are being made, those vibrations, think about each person having a vibe, right? If we actually say this in our, in our vernacular. Um, we've got a vibe. The things we're made out of, the biochemistry, the compounds, the DNA, the nutrients, they're all vibrating. You are, you are vibrating constantly, right? I mean, the question is, are you vibrating like that elementary school band concert or are you vibrating like that a cappella choir? Or where in the continuum are you vibrating? Because there's some really good elementary school bands, right? They're actually pretty in tune. So anyway, I would suggest that back to the 96% of reality is somewhere that the Western scientists can't find it thing, the dark matter, dark energy, but then the Eastern scientists, the, the Hindus and the, you know, the, um, or the Vedics, the Tantrics, the, the um, Taoists, the, the Confucians talk about the, the um, the nadis and the meridians and the chakras and the, the other layers of our being. Um, you know, Jesus talked about it too. I mean, various, the true, I would say, spiritual traditions talk about it. Um, if you understand that most of reality is not on the physical plane and you understand harmonics, if you can get your physical plane to be vibrating in tune, then it becomes easier to ground those higher octaves of reality. And I would say from a political standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from an education standpoint, from an um, environmental standpoint, where do you want to look at the dissonance and rail against it, fight about it, get depressed about it, give up? Like I would suggest because we are vibrating dissonantly, all of our forms are out of tune. Our forms of our culture, our economics, our politics, our, our media, these are representations. These are obvious, obvious effects of our dissonance, right? If we're out of tune, we engage in out of tune activities. So, so we can get pissed about this and justifiably, you know, you know, 
enraged about that. Or you can say, How do we go from here to where I think we want to be? You know, after having acknowledged that I'm not happy with where we are, then what do we do about it? Keep preaching about it? No. That's just amplifying the problem. That's engaging in the duality. That's engaging in the us them. That's the disempowerment. So my thought is if we create a reality where people are vibrating more coherently on the average, then all of the effects of people will be greater coherence. If we want to solve these problems systemically, we need to be solved systemically. Um, I think I said earlier we get a new body every six months. Did I say that before this morning? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, from the, two years the two weeks and the seven years. Yeah, from the blood to the bones. Exactly. <laughs> right. You get you know x number of billion new cells every day, and you know on average a new body every six months. So the mission of the BFA is to increase quality in the food supply. And that means that the ambient level of food next year is better than the ambient level of food right now. And we understand we get new bodies every six months. So that means if we increase the quality of the food supply, that means we increase the coherence in the humans. That means we address systemically this broader dis-ease dissonance. And so we understand that Right now, where culture's at, people move, act based on money to a very large degree. So we can have all of our spiritual, philosophical, political ideals, but if we can't ground a strategy based on visceral self-interest, economic drivers, then we're probably spitting in the wind. So the real strategy around this thing is how do we align economic self-interest with that deeper strategic coherence and solutions-oriented perspective and our thought is, most people these days use money to buy food. And whether or not they should use money to buy food is a moot point because people use money to buy food. And so also these days, people are a couple generations into poor environmental conditions, epigenetic you know, symptomology of dis-ease, right? We've got kids with cancer. We've got people, you know, teens and 20s with you know, life-threatening, you know, gut issues. We got cancers. We got, you know, in general, just low energy, you know, cloudy mind, whatever all the things that you guys are working on are people are looking for solutions for. I mean, I would say at its root, if you are building your body out of junk, you should expect to be vibrating out of tune. And so what's exciting right now is that people are starting to fall apart, right? Like we, do well with f crisis. We're fight or flight, you know, okay, here comes the, the you know, the, the tiger or the, the wolf. We'll strategically figure out how to deal with that. If it's two miles away, we're still, you know, fighting and doing whatever we're doing. But when, when, when it comes down to survival, all of a sudden we're really good. So it's gonna take that, well, that's where we're at now, it doesn't matter. Like it's no longer a question of will it take that, that's where we're at right now. So I'm excited. I've been waiting for this because I think I've got to read on the ambient level of like how we act. And it is pain, pleasure, pain. When your kids are sick, there's not a lot that you'll like getting in your way, right? Maybe you won't take care of yourself, but you, a lot of people will pretty much do whatever needs to be done to take care of their kids. So um, our thought is, given that there's three different bags of carrots on the shelf, given that there's three different kinds of milk on the shelf, if you could go to the grocery store and flash a light, boop, boop, junk, boop, boop, decent, boop, boop, good. Or if there were 50 people across the country that could, like I use the example of organic milk. I use you know, Organic Valley and Stonyfield and, and, and um, Horizon, right, on many shelves. If there were 50 people around the country that had a meter and went and bought each of the three jugs and flash the light at each one, got the reading and uploaded it. And 48 of those 50 people all found that one company, you know, we'll say Horizon was better. My guess is that would get out on social media. My guess is there would be a motion in the market to start having the Horizon milk leave the shelf faster and the Stonyfield milk stay on and the longer. So it's direct visceral self-interest as a strategy. 
How do we, how do we facilitate this? Um, so that's the, broad, that's the broad strategy and agenda. What we've done, we started this five years ago. We um, identified three things that needed to be done. We said we need um, to figure out that variation in food quality because nobody's defined good and decent and bad. Right? There is no database anywhere which says this is a, a good carrot, this is a decent carrot, this is a bad carrot. Nobody's done it. The people that have the money and the capacity don't have the incentive. Um, so one thing we have to do is figure out the variation in nutrient levels. The second thing we have to do is figure out what the causal factors are, which management practices, which varieties, which microbiomes, which, you know, prayer, which structured water. What are the connections between these management practices and environmental conditions and those nutrient variations? So what is, what's the variation? What causes the variation? And then can we test it? Um, so we started this process in 2016 conceptually, 2017 we built the first meter, 2018 we built our first lab, we tested our first two crops, 2019 we built a second lab, tested four more crops and started working with growers to test the soil and correlate the management practices, 2020 we built our third lab, went up to over two dozen crops, over you know, 200 farms, um, and now we've got a second generation meter which is calibrated to 10 crops um, out of the 25, we had enough data. To basically, the people send in the crop to the lab, the carrot, the rice, the wheat, the whatever it is. We flash a light at it with this and then put it through the lab. So we have the picture of the, of the spectrum and then we have the calcium level, potassium level, sulfur level, polyphenol level, antioxidant level. You run 500 carrots through the lab and you connect them to management practices. We also do this with the soil, right? So soil organic matter, soil biological activity, soil mineral levels. We connect it to variety. So we can tease out the connections between variety and management and soil carbon and nutrient levels. And we've got this big open data platform. Right now it's called the Data Explorer. It's gonna be called the Digital Coffee Shop in two months where you can actually, anybody who's, done, who's globally taken part in this process and has their data, which of course is their data, so no one can see who they are unless they want them to. So you have complete autonomy, right? Not this, this Google and Amazon data mining strategy, but complete data control. So, you know, it, we have to look at this whole the way that, that this, this process is being done. And we built, I think, a pretty impressive structure around it and behind it. Um, so now we can actually horizontally, globally share with each other, this is what I did, what did you do? And you can ask questions. And if you want, like, you're looking at your reports and you're like, oh, you see this person over here. You can't see who they are, but you can see what they did and what, and what the results were. So you can, you know, text them basically and say, hey, I'm curious about this question. Can you share with me? Right? So we have a horizontal framework for direct empiricism and guidance to be shared. So it's not coming through an agronomist, not coming through a salesperson, not coming through somebody up front who you, know, you think is worth listening to. It's, it's totally horizontal for every grower globally to take part in if they want to. Our thought is collectively we have the wisdom. Collectively, we have the, the outstanding practitioners, and who knows what age they are, what color they are, what gender they are, what continent they're living on, but we can find it if they take part in the process and we can learn from each other. Um, so, so yeah, so we've defined variation. We've said, look, copper top to bottom on carrots is three to one. You know, uh, iron top to bottom on spinach is 15 to one. Um, you know, zinc top to bottom on oats is 60 to one. Uh, polyphenols top to bottom on, you know, whatever. Cucumbers is 200 to one, right? It's not 10%, 15% variation. It's 2x, 5x, 10x, 20x from top to bottom. We've defined variation on a number of different elements and compounds. We've said it's massive across the board. We've looked at roots and leaves and fruits and grains. Um, that's great. Variation exists. That was one of the questions. People doubted that it existed. When we started this project, they said, no, maybe it's 10% variation. And we're like, no, it's actually... 10,000% variation. Um, so now we have to define nutrient density. And this is where it comes back to, to um, cannabis and where we would, how we would engage this process if we were to do so. Um, looking at a couple different elements and a couple compounds to, to show that variation exists is part of the process. We've called it proof of concept. Let's, let's show that we can build a handheld flash of light meter at a consumer price point that's open source. Let's, let's do it. Let's do a first generation to show it's possible. Let's define, let's, let's, let's run thousands of samples of crops through a lab 
testing various nutrients to show variation is massive. Let's build a data framework where we can show the connections between management and soil health and nutrient variations. Let's, let's build that framework to show it's possible. And now that we've done that, five years in, we've done that. We feel like we've accomplished that. Now we go to getting the job done, which is defining nutrient density. And so we're starting with beef. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm passionately speaking. And my throat's getting dry. Um, so what we're doing with beef is we're saying, we're not going to look at 15 elements and three compounds. We're going to look at 500 elements and 35 compounds. And we're going to look at the complete mi microbiome of the fecal material. Um, so what we're doing is we're saying, right now, it's, it's, just, it's just numbers. So we need 750 samples of steak. The target is from 200 farms, um, you know, a, a bunch of them off the shelf so we can get variation. We're going to you know, do a, you know, many hundreds of compounds assessment of each steak. So we're looking at the lipids. We're looking at the amino acids. We're looking at the secondary metabolites. We're looking at the minerals. We're looking at the enzymes and vitamins. And when we can look at, with 750 samples, you can look at the levels and ratios of all these different things. Then you can begin to say red, yellow, green. This is good beef, this is decent beef, and this is bad beef, right? That's gonna be our first standard is, like, can we empirically define meat and say, this stuff actually will cause you to get less well. This stuff actually will cause you to get more well. Because it's not about meat being good or bad, it's about good meat versus bad meat. It's not about you know, wheat being good or bad or milk being good or bad. It's about good wheat and bad wheat. Um, it's how it was grown de determines how it affects you and how it affects the environment. So uh, the process is we go through crop by crop and we you know, get a variation of management and genetic um, and we get the soil and everything else into it um, and we build that variation and then we, once we have that data, then we can calibrate the meter. And this one is rudimentary. This has only got 10 LEDs, is how it works. Um, so the next generation is gonna be part of the process. You can't build a meter to a standard until you've got the standard. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have to define nutrient density first. Once we've done that, then we can say, okay, looks like these are the levels and ratios. Looks like this is the concentration ranges and the, you know, the, discer the, the, the discernment levels we need. And then we can engineer the next generation meter and then it can be available. So it's a process. We've completed proof of concept. Everything's open source. Everything is donations. The app is open source. The data set's open source. The engineering's open source. You can download how to build this right now. You can build one of your own. You can, you can sell them. It's open source. We don't control it. It's in the commons. Um, the objective is to maintain this understanding in the commons and then let people make money off of it because most people need to pay the bills until they get totally independent from the economic system and are empowered on the land and we don't have governments causing us to pay taxes and things like that, we're going to have to engage with money. So um, we want to support people in making money by doing the right thing, right? It's not that making money is a bad thing. It's just make the money doing, doing a good thing. Where you put your energy, if you're using toxins, if you're buying toxins, and applying toxins, and people are smoking toxins, then one could argue you're making money doing a bad thing, or a not totally good thing, right? We're all somewhere in the ecosystem. You buy a burger from McDonald's, you're putting money, you're putting energy into that system. You're buying chemicals, you're putting energy into that system. You're using chemicals, you're putting them into people's systems, right? Deal with it. Um, so, <laughs> Um, anyway, that's probably enough on the meter, or at least enough to start with. Uh, we're right around one, but before we wrap this yeah. up, can you tell people what the local chapters of the BFA are and what they do and where they can find you at and kind of look that up for themselves to answer for the community? Um, you're still me some softballs here. Uh, so um, the BFA, Biodiversity Food Association, is the organization that I'm the executive director of. Uh, website is bionutrient.org. Um, if you want to see the science side, you go to bionutrientinstitute.org. If you want access to the 10 years of conferences with all the global elders that we've hosted since 2010 or 11, you go to soilandnutrition.org. 
every single presentation at every single one of our conferences since the beginning has been recorded and is freely available on the internet. Um, um, <clears throat> you can join uh, five bucks a month, 50 bucks um, is membership. Um, there's a bunch of benefits. You can't buy a meter if you're not a member. Um, and you can't, you know, we got little garden kits. So, you know, I mean, we got this really, I call it cheating. A mineral blend, a liquid blend, and an inoculant pack. 50 bucks, a couple hundred square feet. It, <laughs> I call it cheating for a reason. It works. You don't have to know what you're doing. <laughs> it just works. Um, so, yeah, we've got local chapters, um, decentralized. The concept is, in my mind, um, you've got these local nodes everywhere of people, organizations, networks, you got the you got the biodynamic community, you got the organic community, you got the permaculturalists, you got the agroecologists, you got the nutritionists, you got the 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 three fifty dot org people, you've got the I mean the local community farm, community education farm. There's all these amazing people doing all this amazing work all over the place, right? Everywhere. Amazing people. But I like to think of us as tilled. The web between us is not well established. The mycelia have been destroyed. Think about each of our little communities as like a, a bacterial colony. We have everything we need, all the people, all the leadership, all the empowerment from the bottom up, right, is already there, but it's not, it's not coordinating with itself. And so our thought is, can we coordinate around the quality of food? Can we have food being better as something that we all agree upon. Like, can the permaculturalists agree on that? Can the organic people agree on that? Can the agroecologists agree on that? Can the regenerative people agree on that? Can the nutritionists agree on that? I mean, who, can the conventional ag people agree on that? Can the USDA? Yeah, they can. We're all people. There's great people in universities. There's great people in the USDA. There's great people in Monsanto. There's good people everywhere. Just about everybody's good. There's a couple people that are sociopaths that are happen to be in the wrong positions of power, but the vast majority of people are good people. We've got souls, right? We have children, we have families, we have, we have hearts. We're fulfilled by, by love, not by, not by pain, not by anger. So I would suggest that you know, the quality of food is a, it could be a, an organizing high ground around which we build solutions instead of fighting problems, right? Fighting the problem, is putting your energy into that separation, into the duality. Building solutions is putting your energy into unity, into fulfillment and love. Um, so, yeah, the idea with the chapters is we don't tell you what to do. We welcome you to stand up from your network and collect and connect to the web. And let's, let's, let's establish that mycelial network amongst ourselves with data sovereignty, with transparency with empiricism with respect um, and so yeah that's one of the ways to engage is you know join the organization send us an email say I want to be a local chapter leader um, you know we have online conversations presentations um, you know oftentimes the chapters will host up a, a, a potluck um, the general model is once a month potluck and education thing. So at a farm, at a garden, you know, this, this month we're talking about inoculation. This month we're talking about mineral balancing. This month we're, we're gonna be transplanting. And it's a different person's farm, different person's house, different person's garden. And you have, you break bread together, you have meals together, you develop relationships, especially after this period, the last couple of years when we've been so separated from each other. I think there's a profound hunger for this. And, and you know, I mean, a lot of <laughs> psychological dis-ease from this separation. Foundationally, are we connecting or are we separating? Is it love or is it fear? So a, a framework for that to occur um, with as little top-down pressure as possible, but hopefully a web of support for those of like mind to coalesce and self-organize, um, basically is the vision of the chapters. Um, organizationally, historically, we've not been able to support them to the degree I would have liked, but we are at the point where this spring we're going to be really actively pushing out a lot of structures of support. Um, so, all right, break for lunch. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, sorry, yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> He's
got, he's got some things to say for a couple minutes.